We good? Okay. Oh. Action. Where am I? Oh, yes, I'm in my second home here. Um, let's see. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is the uh, Thursday, March 7th, 2024 meeting of the School Building Advisory Committee. Uh, with that, Mr. Sturgis, do we, did you take uh, attendance? Madam Chairman, you have a quorum. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, do we want to approve the minutes without objection? The move is both. I knew I could count on you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank That's you. all I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> no, you rescue people. So. Uh, Second. Okay, let's go. Um, with that, uh, reports and correspondence. Do any members have? Uh, are you opening a beer? <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> Um, are, uh, is there anybody who has any reports and correspondence? So I have just a little bit I wanted, wanted to share. We, since the last meeting, we did receive um, a lot of public feedback, and um, a lot of that was around um, the last meeting, and, and people um, concerned uh, that there wasn't uh, a discussion or consideration of some of their feedback regarding the options that were chosen. And I just really wanted to acknowledge that. Um, we heard you, we appreciate that, and we are definitely working to be more inclusive and also more kind of transparent about our decision making in the future. Uh, we really do want people to continue to reach out and we really appreciate all of the input we receive. So um, if uh, I, I just really wanted to acknowledge the 250 people plus that, that took the time to uh, provide their feedback uh, when we asked for it regarding those options, and we would still like to hear from you um, as much as possible. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Matthew Sturgis, yes. Madam Chair, just, as a, just for a housekeeping item, and you notice on your agendas that the next meeting is scheduled for uh, March 28th at 6.30. So it won't be on the 21st. The council has their uh, second budget workshop on the 21st. So that's why we'll be having that on the 28th. So if you could adjust your uh, dance cards accordingly, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. That's, uh, and that's up on the website already, yes, yep. that it's that date? Yep, we have okay. it all there. And uh, Zoom already accounted for, so we should be good to go. Okay. Um, I wanted to uh, let the committee know that um, at our um, May 2nd meeting, which is where um, we will ideally be making, um, uh, developing our recommendation on what option we would put forth to the um, school board and town council, that that will be a facilitated session by Craig Freshly. I thought that, uh, uh, we thought that that could be uh, a good approach to make sure that we have um, uh, stated, make sure we state what our rationale is, that we go through a process to really get to an, an agreed upon uh, solution uh, or recommendation. Is Larry here? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yep. Okay. He's with us. Larry, I keep looking up for some reason. Um, and uh, I think that is the key thing here. So with that, is there any public comment? Anybody want to come forward with public comment? No? Okay. Is there anyone online? Is there any online? No, nope, nothing online. How many people are online? We currently have eight, or actually seven, counting the... Counting Larry? Okay. Um, with that, um, the next item, it, uh, will be an update uh, from our owner's rep, uh, Chuck Adams. After that, uh, Lisa from Harriman will be doing, um, providing an update as to where we're at with the uh, development of our three options. Then we will have updates from our subcommittees. So with that, Chuck, the floor is yours. Thank you. We have our update this week is very simple. Our update this week is we are spending more and more time visiting with Lisa and her team um, as they're going through the 
process of refining your three options. We did spend some time looking at schedules and which you have seen in your packets and they were all sent out to you. We discussed it again this morning at the communication subcommittee meeting. Um, and there was a tentative date, and Lisa and I were just talking about this with Emily. There was a tentative date for a meeting for next week for you all. We're gonna encourage you to keep that meeting. So We're gonna what? Encourage you to keep that meeting, to post that meeting and have that as a full SBAC meeting next week. It's very helpful to us to make sure that we're continuing to move down the road because from that meeting we'll be able to really release our estimating teams after that. So that's our really our big highlight, but we have spent a lot of time looking at the schedule. There are some added meetings that everybody has seen um, at the request of some very smart people on this board to start meeting with the town council and the school board. And we think that's really important to get out in front of them early. So we highly encourage that and we put that into the schedule that we share with you. Thank you. So that's really what we've all been doing. Uh, there has been nothing new to price yet because they're still going through the options. So there'll be no cost information as it relates to that tonight until we really start to define the options with you all, which is what tonight's very lengthy, a lot of slides from where they sit at this point, which is great. And I think you'll see some, some nice work that's been being done. Okay. So we'll be having a meeting on the 14th of March at 6.30. Correct. Okay, everybody's good with that? What? So everything I said a couple minutes ago, please change, <laughs> change that to the 14th, as well as the 28th, if you would, please. Yep. <laughs> change, add the 14th. Uh, oh, okay. Still keep the 28th as okay. well, please. Yeah, <laughs> we miss it when we don't see each other each week. Um, so we're meeting on the 14th and the 21st? Uh, the 28th, 21st will be open. 14th and 28th, okay. Yep. Okay, and that make sure that's up there so people um, who are like me and forget. And that, that meeting is really where the team wants to really gather your, your building committee's comments on the information you're gonna see tonight and all of that. So we can capture those comments, refine those into the final documents that are gonna go off to the, the estimators. That's why it's real important to us. That's it. Is that? That's it for me. Chuck, if I, if I may, Madam Chair, just yeah. ask Chuck a question. So for the agenda for that, we'll, we'll have the primary focus. We'll just say uh, to receive uh, to receive comments and on the alternatives presented this evening. And that'll right. be the that'll be the agenda item. That's great. Okay. We might have a short pre 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 presentation, but it'll be really to have them pull up the do documents for you to see and then start to incorporate those comments in. Awesome. That's, that's gonna be the number one agenda item. Okay, I'll, I'll get the agenda pulled together, we'll get it posted, get the Zoom info, and we'll get everything up on the, uh, on the website as soon as we can. Thank you. One question. Would it be helpful for everyone involved if uh, prior to the next meeting, we have an organized way to put our questions on paper? Sure, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, and we've always thought that the best way to get those, if you could get those through to the su 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 superintendent, he can feed those to us. And therefore, we're get, they're coming all at one time from us, one place. I don't want to ever get in the way where we're feeding it from so many di to different places. We might miss something that way. So I'll send out a, a Google Doc after tonight so you can send in your questions. Um, and then we'll get them to Lisa and her team. Perfect. Yeah. Very helpful. Else? Anybody else? Okay. It's now Lisa. It's all her. I'm, I'm not saying this to rush you, Lisa, but how long do you think it's going to take to go through 73 pages? It's a lot of work, thank you very much. Thank you. 
you've had. I got lots of coffee. <laughs> I got lots of coffee. <laughs> that we left these back. <laughs> the proposed uh, middle school. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful work. <laughs> Thank you. I'm in, I'm in. You guys have been looking at the, rent, uh, the rendering for a while. This is the actual final photography of that space. They're doing their first, they just did their first production in there, Shrek the Musical. That's Edward oh, wow. Little. It's Edward Little High School, oh, yep. Beautiful. Great work. That was, that was one of their high priorities. All right, here we go. Well, good evening. It's been a while since we've seen each other. <laughs> um, I hope everybody um, uh, has been well these past few weeks. Um, I know our team has been busy based on the feedback we got the last time we met, um, developing the three options. And I, I wanna emphasize that we're in the development of these options. What, what you're seeing tonight is by no means final. Um, you're going to see, there was a request to see square footages for some of these, uh, for all of them really. Um, we have two that we can share the square footage with. We met with the special education team late this week to finalize a few questions and clarifications we needed to really fine tune the programming. So one of the options, we weren't ready to release the square footage because it just wasn't 100% and we don't wanna put out information that's not uh, uh, fully vetted yet. Um, so you'll see um, uh, square footages for C and E. Um, B is still um, being analyzed from a special education standpoint and programming. So we'll update those numbers. They're actively being worked on. Um, we met, we had a great meeting with special education director and principals. Um, I think it was Tuesday, late Tuesday afternoon, about four or five o'clock. Um, and we were able to then take that information and go through two of the options very thoroughly. Um, and we're almost done with that third one. Um, so we'll follow up after this meeting with that information um, so that everybody has that. But I just, again, wanna emphasize this is a progress update. Um, the, um, we have questions for folks. We want feedback. Um, if anything isn't clear, let us know. We may not have the answer tonight, but we'll go back and get it. Um, and uh, if there is additional um, detailed information that you need, um, please continue to reach out. We got a lot of feedback um, from the leadership team on questions I think uh, folks had forwarded. So <clears throat> the agenda um, tonight is to go through the refined options and a lot of these slides, just making sure people are coming along with us, understanding some folks have been with us every step of the way in the public. Others may just be chiming in right now, so I wanted to make sure that we had the information as to how we've gotten to this point. I'm not going through all seven options, but the original B, the original C, the original E's, and then showing folks what um, has uh, been adjusted. Um, we're gonna go over the enrollment memo and our approach um, in uh, laying out the uh, modifications uh, to the schools. We're gonna go over the high school scope. There was a request last time to break out the high school scope, both in repair, renovation, addition. We have that information in the slides. Um, I will also say the, this slide deck is updated from what you received earlier in the week. That was a draft, and we continue to develop things as we come into this meeting. So um, Emily is in the process of PDFing this PowerPoint and getting that to everybody so you have it. Um, we're going to do an overview of the special education programming, um, and we also talked to um, the elementary school principal and just went through what we understood the priorities to be for the elementary, especially as we start talking about option E. And option E, to remind folks, is a new middle school with a lighter touch at the elementary and high school, but we wanted to make sure we understood 
what are those priorities at the elementary school and are we approaching that light touch in the correct way? So we'll go over that. We're gonna talk about mechanical systems and uh, fair warning, there's a lot of detailed information in here about mechanical systems. Um, I'm not gonna go through every aspect of it, but there was a specific request to um, provide preliminary information on efficiency main incentives um, as we look at the options. So we have them for the base scope, and the base scope is cooling only in library admin and summer programs. The ad alternate scope was we were asked to explore full cooling, which would then have the ERV um, uh, in the whole building. So we have that information this evening. Um, and then we'll go over next steps and schedule and discussion. Um, it was mentioned that we would recommend we meet next week. The reason being is we wanna take the feedback we hear tonight, incorporate it into next week, and then we really need to start getting that, these options to our estimator on the 15th to be able to start to get this information in the queue to be able to get you guys cost of information, both to do the tax impact, but also to review it before the forum. I know that sounds like a long way away, but it has to go through our cost estimator, it has to go through the OPM's cost estimator, it has to come back, both parties review it, we vet it, we make sure they're all on the same page, then it goes back into the PowerPoint and comes back to you. So there's a lot of steps um, to really get that um, in there. So that was the whole presentation, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, so we originally had options A through G, and E and F had sub options, E1 and F, E1 and E2 and F1 and F2. Last meeting on February 15th, um, we received the feedback from the SBAC to refine this to three options. B, with some additional scope, C with some reduced scope, and then some version of E that looks at replacing the middle school and doing the prioritized work for the elementary school. Um, and one of the biggest, and so that's what this slide um, illustrates. Um, one of the biggest questions we have and what we need feedback on is the high school and how much scope in the high school are we incorporating into each one of these options um, and how do you want to prioritize that scope? Um, so that's one of the biggest things you'll see is not, uh, is kind of peppered throughout the presentation is just really needing clarification on that and we'll provide more detail as we go through. Um, I think most of you have seen this. We circulated this um, the morning after the, uh, we met on the um, 15th. Um, and uh, this is what we took away um, from that meeting. Um, and we referred to it as we're now going into the B plus option. Um, so it's building off of the original option B. Um, and we're doing the C minus. Um, and we say plus and minus, it means additional scope, which equates to money, or reduced scope, which equates to less money. Um, and then we called it E3. This would be the new middle school with a different um, approach than we did in E1 or E2 to the elementary school. Um, and with the thinking with E, that we think about what was option G, and this was replacement of elementary middle school, and we further refine this to include high school, but thinking about with option E, it really is the one of these three options that best sets itself up for and I, if you wanna think about a long-term approach to replacement of the schools, the option E3 invests the most in the middle school, and we look at what the scope is at the elementary, but by not doing a, whole, a bunch of renovation and or addition there, you're not replacing that work in the relative near future, whatever you guys determine would be the right time to take on the replacement. Um, and the same goes for the high school. So that's what that means by setting us up for G+, plus, we call it. And then we received um, a bunch of um, feedback and comments um, that evening, and uh, we summarized that on the right-hand side. Um, but essentially, we were asked to break out the cost for um, the elementary, middle school, and the high school in each option. Um, we have been able to break down a lot of the high school work um, right now in regards to um, 
Uh, to that, we're, gonna, we're still going through the elementary and middle school to that level of detail, and you'll see how much information um, uh, there is. Um, and then um, we were asked for the cost for the Title IX works um, right-sizing at the high school, independent of other renovations and additions. We went ahead and just broke out all the high school work so you guys can see what that is. Um, on the aerial plans, um, I shouldn't say we didn't break out the elementary, and I'll take that back. We broke out the repair um, scope for mechanical specifically for the three schools. We felt like that was one of the bigger areas of scope of work. Um, we can take it even further, um, but we need to start somewhere, and it's a pretty big undertaking to itemize all that and be able to put it in a form that you guys can digest um, easily on the screen. Um, we, um, we've updated our aerial plans. Um, we've looked at the enrollment study, um, and, and we'll talk about that. Um, we have reached out to our uh, technology um, uh, design team and are engaging them in conversations about the addition renovation options. Um, as we move forward, we can talk about breaking out the design of certain, certain scope items that you guys might carry out as CIP later. Uh, request to review AC slash heat pumps and efficiency main incentives in each option. We have that this evening. Um, we have that for the original BCE options as well as right now where we're tracking for the B plus, C minus, E3 option. Um, Long-term strategy for buildings. Um, so that is really the E3 to the G plus option. And then in option B, we were asked to analyze adding a second floor to the cafeteria kitchen to address missing spaces, and you will see that tonight. Option E, um, we were asked to look at, there's a lot of feedback on the location of the middle school. We were asked to look at putting that on the multi-purpose field. That is where it's located in the option we're sharing this evening. Um, we will go over the prioritized um, scope for the elementary school. And um, through the um, uh, cooling and uh, HVAC work, the electrification. Right now we're looking at the VRF, which is an electrification system, or aligns with that. Um, explore leaving admin as it is in adding smaller office addition. You'll see how we've gone about the admin and the um, this uh, option tonight, and look at potential to build a way to leverage middle school spaces to be shared uh, with future elementary school project. Um, You'll see the way that this is starting to set up on site. There's a, there's a pretty big diff distance between the two, two buildings right now, but different ways, oops, I'm not touching my computer enough. It's going to sleep. Um, different ways that um, we can think about that is um, you have everything on one campus. The kitchen is a great way to save um, having one cooking kitchen or a reduction in cooking kitchens and being able to share across schools is one way to do that. Um, performance space is another. Um, so we'll continue to brainstorm those ideas, um, but also welcome feedback from everybody as well. Just want to pause, make sure we got feedback and what we initially, we made a couple adjustments. Does this capture what you guys walked away with at the last meeting? Okay, awesome. <coughs> All right, the text was much bigger on this, but I kept adding to it, so I apologize, Emily. The graphics aren't as good as when you did it the first time. <laughs> um, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, there, was, there was a comment, um, and I think, Michael, you brought it up this morning, what are we trying to solve? So I want, we went back and we went each item and we added notes um, to try to address what it is each of these options um, are doing. Um, so I'm gonna start at the top. It's probably easier to see. You said this is not what we have on our... Correct. This was added since the one you got. You added this in. Thank you for adding this. this there was some... I, I didn't articulate it that well, but there was some confusion that me or members of this committee did not understand the needs. What I was trying to say was we understand the needs, but we want to understand which needs are being solved for across yep. the three options. Yeah, and I'm glad you clarified that this morning because then it made crystal clear sense. And so we went back and we, we've added this. Um, if it's still not clear, let us know. Uh, we can clarify more. Or if, um, and sometimes, as you can see, there's only so much room on the slide. We may have just not articulated something here, but it is in the option, so please ask. Um, 
So using our prioritized needs that we set out with, um, starting with repairs, in option B plus, um, and this is the same, I'm gonna slide across, we're gonna do repairs all at once, C minus and E3, right now we are um, under the impression that repairs are included in the elementary and, well, it shouldn't say middle school in that last one because essentially it's a new building, so we'll correct that. But the repairs at the elementary and middle school are included in B plus and C minus. The repairs at the elementary school are included at E3. And we want feedback on what we should include for repairs for the high school. So that's kind of what, um, where that uh, uh, priority stands in all three options. <clears throat> Efficiency upgrades. Um, and, and there's overlap in all these, as we've talked about. Um, there's some, you know, wall repair that could tie into efficiency because we have to do some insulation or something like that, or roof replacement, that would be in the repair number. But thinking about HVAC replacement, repairs and replacement, and um, oh, another one we had talked about was flooring, um, a lot of the waxing that's going on, going with a floor that's less, main, less maintenance. HVAC repairs or replacement at all school, confirm work at high school, and then flooring replacement in reno and add areas, and that is the same for B plus and C minus. And for E3, um, it is the same, um, but there will be obviously new flooring at the middle school, so you are able to um, address more of that um, in that project. Um, security improvements. Secure entries for the elementary middle school happen at B plus. Wayfinding renovation doubles as gathering hub slash pull off space. So that's kind of a, um, a, a scope item that uh, addresses two needs. Um, same, um, same at C, the difference is you now have a separate entrance, separate locations for the entrances at C minus. Elementary middle school are separate entrance uh, locations on the site. And then for E3, you can, um, it's a comprehensive approach uh, to safety and security at the middle school um, as it's a new building. It addresses security improvements at elementary with admin addition, wayfinding, and other scope items. And wayfinding renovation, again, doubles as gathering hub such pullover space and then confirm the high school work. Um, and that really note, that note should be on all three of those for the high school. Um, healthy buildings. Um, so looking at what's called displacement ventilation at addition areas, um, essentially that is a way to deliver um, outside air down low, less energy needed. It then comes up out of the space. It gets all the contaminants out. It's a, it's a very healthy um, uh, HVAC system. Um, cooling is provided at the admin library and summer programs. And the reason we chose that scope is that's a traditional cooling approach in schools. Um, and uh, because those are the spaces that are used almost year round. Um, <clears throat> and then at C, um, very similar um, uh, scope here as well, actually exactly the same. Um, and then the same at the um, option E3, um, knowing that um, uh, just more of that scope with the middle school. Cafeteria improvements, um, option B plus addresses um, this at the elementary middle school. We need to know um, if you want to address that at the high school in this project. Um, and then same for um, essentially all the options when we get um, to the middle school um, or the E3, it will be a new, um, new cafeteria there as well. Um, but also, it's new cafeteria for the elementary middle school um, in B plus and C minus. In E3, you have the existing cafeteria being used for the elementary school, and then the new school will have a new cafeteria. Right size functional needs, B plus um, has a second floor of the cafeteria addition for special education programming. Um, we heard very loud and clear Title IX athletic space needs to be addressed at the high school. We put that in here. If it needs to be taken out, let us know. Um, def uh, there remains a deficit of classrooms, restrooms, and program spaces in this option. Um, restroom reno is included at the elementary middle school. 
um, and then we'll need to confirm if, if that is to be included at the high school. Um, and at C minus, um, second floor addition at the cafeteria um, for SPED programming, address Title IX athletic scope at high school, um, other renovation addition to high school to be determined. And right now we're exploring, based on the special education meeting, um, integrating the small group spaces at the elementary school uh, for, I should say elementary and middle school for uh, the RTI and SPED uh, pullout spaces. And so um, with meeting with SPED, we got a lot more clarification on how they wanna use certain spaces. Um, and one approach is having kind of a home base for the RTI staff, but then having these small group spaces in the classroom neighborhoods that they can go pull students from that neighborhood so a kindergarten student doesn't have to walk all the way to the RTI room to get their services. They're right there. They can do different work with small groups in that area. Then it also, when it's not being used as RTI, is used for that collaboration small group space. So again, dual purpose. Um, but we're looking at, in this option, how many of those we can get in this option. Um, so that's what's uh, continuing to be explored right now. Um, we'll see that um, this evening. And then this does meet the classroom and restroom count needs. So this is C, C minus. Um, option E3 addresses Title IX athletic scope at high school, other renovation addition at high school to be determined. Uh, we're exploring that the integration of that small group space um, for elementary school at the RTI SPED um, pullout spaces. The new middle school meets the classroom and restroom size count and needs. Um, and what we're confirming right now um, in the elementary school um, is a possible elementary school programming deficit. I think we confirmed tonight or right before the meeting that we're okay, but we just wanna go back and double check that. Um, and, um, and that we're not missing any programming after, after the SPED meeting. Um, Does the, enroll, do the enrollment figures figure into that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, gathering and collaboration hubs. Um, okay, so in B plus, we have done a STEM renovation adjacent to the elementary school. So we took the world language room that was there. There was a strange layout going on. You had to go through a room to get to another service provider. We relocated the world language and we renovated that space next to the library for STEM. Um, so that addresses gathering collaboration hubs as, as well as um, uh, some programmatic space. Wayfinding renovation doubles as gathering hub slash pull um, pullover space. So again, that's a scope item that touches a lot of, um, of the priorities and then obviously the renovation of the high school to be determined. At C minus, um, STEM renovation adjacent to the elementary school library and then the wayfinding, so very similar. Um, and then, and so in, in the B plus and the C minus, in some of the previous ones we had large spaces dedicated to collaboration. We've taken a different approach. We've minimized some of the small additions on the C option that you'll see. And we prioritize the small group and one-on-one -on -one spaces because we heard that loud and clear and we can use some of those wayfinding spaces that we're renovating for some of that collaboration space. Um, so you'll see that as well. Um, in option E3, the middle school classroom neighborhood collaboration, uh, the middle school classroom neighborhoods have collaboration and presentation space. What we were able to do is take that collaboration space and actually make a stair connecting the two levels um, and make it so that it's almost a seat, seated stair. We call it a community stair or a learning stair. It doubles as a place for the grade levels to get together, be able to do um, impromptu performances, speeches, presentations. It's a very flexible space. In talking with the middle school principal, um, they liked the idea a lot because now it allows them to really uh, be flexible with the way they set up the middle school. They can do a horizontal uh, or vertical arrangement in the classroom wing. Um, and so there's a lot more flexibility in how they lay out those, um, those uh, programs. And so sometimes they'll set up like one floor is let's say seventh grade and sometimes they'll set it up to where it's five through 
eight, and it's a different configuration. And then when they can have that vertical connection, they can have more of the same level grade um, teachers being able to collaborate that way. Um, but a lot of opportunities in that. Um, STEM edition adjacent to the elementary library. So um, one of the things we talked about prioritizing with the um, principal was um, getting the STEM room, but also setting the library up more like a learning common. So looking at the investments that are being made in the elementary school in E3 to be something that is available to everybody. Um, so if we are investing in program space and thinking about the learning commons or library, this is a place that has uh, addresses varied learning styles. Um, there's collaboration, there's reading spaces, there's adjacency to STEM. I think a lot of people were inspired by the Wentworth tour that we took um, in, in that library. So kind of thinking about that with an adjacent STEM program. Um, and then wayfinding renovation, again doubling as um, some of that collaboration space. So agile, flexible classrooms. Um, this ties directly into the enrollment conversation tonight, and we'll go through that in a minute. You'll hear me refer to a six plus one and a six plus two approach. And what this means is we're thinking about classroom space and how can we be flexible to be able to, we, we know sometimes there'll be a grade that needs an additional classroom one year and not, you know, as it goes through, another class follows and it's one grade level less. So we thought of, well, when we set up a classroom neighborhood, you have classrooms and then there is a special education space incorporated into that. So we looked at where we can, and we can't do it everywhere, but a flexible model would be to have, to make sure that that special education room, or in some cases, the middle school world language and special education, are the same size as the classroom. And what that allows you to do is if, let's say, first grade is a six plus one, so all the elementary school, six plus one, and this, this, this works with really whatever enrollment figure we use, whether it's the memo or the projections, you'll see the classrooms are, are very similar. But the six plus one, so if a first grade needs seven classrooms that year, and let's say second grade only needs five, well that special education or world language can move to the other classroom wing and now we freed up a classroom for that grade level and they are all together. So just trying to create that flexibility so we can move different programs around but still keep the classroom grade level together so that they can all be functioning as a, as a unit. Um, so that, that's, what we t that's what we mean when we say a six plus one or a six plus two approach and you'll see that in the plan. The only reason middle school is six plus two is because of the number of world language classes. So that, that's how we went about it in those two, and it, it works out more flexible in C than it does in, does in B. Um, and then we took the same approach um, in E3, um, and we talked about, again, that collaboration space, having that, that vertical connection as well as um, uh, <clears throat> a collaboration space on the floor. Um, and the ability to set up horizontal or vertical middle school approach. Well, Lisa, is it what you're seeing up there? Does it indicate that we can do that with B and C? Um, we we have closer to full size. Uh, well, I would say um, so in the renovation of the. Um, parts of the elementary and middle school, you don't have full size compared to 800 square foot DOE. But just using generally what your classroom sizes are, we can get very close in B and C to making that, that flexible model work, especially in the elementary school. We come to some challenges in um, uh, getting the proximity in the middle school just because of the configuration, especially in that older area. Um, it works for the fifth grade, um, and um, we just run into some challenges over where the sixth grade um, area is. Layout modification, B plus, exploring relocating program. 
out of lower level. Um, so that lower level is not um, the same as all the other spaces in the building. Um, and so looking at ways to get the programs out of that lower level and getting them incorporated with the rest of the programs within the school. So we're just throwing out considerations, maybe consider l locating um, the district programs that are in the school in that location, or we also put on here, maybe look at putting those district programs in the high school um, or somewhere else. Um, just, Lisa, so yeah. people know what you're talking about. Lower level is the 1930s lowest yeah. level of that building. Right? Correct. Thanks. Um, layout modification at C. Um, we have added, uh, we have removed the middle school program wing and relocated it closer to the performance area. So that is a, a reconfiguration. And we've also minimized the additions compared to the original C option. And then for E3, um, the middle school separates, um, really is able to do that separation we've been talking about so much of separating the public space from the more private space, allowing uh, both, it helps for community access to a building, but also helps with safety and security. Um, the new middle school allows the classrooms to be kind of co-located right now. They're pretty, um, uh, fifth grade is very separate from six, through eight, the plan we'll show you has two wings, one grade level per floor. Um, and then um, it also uh, sets it up for the teaming model that um, is utilized in middle school um, and reinforces a sense of community as everyone comes back to that shared communal space for all the programming that is not in their classroom wing. And then looking at relocating district programs to the high school or adding to new middle school um, for those district programs, but that is currently not in the plan you'll see tonight. And then the last but not least, outdoor learning and play. Um, there wasn't anything specific that we identified at this time in B plus, C minus. Um, one thing that the new middle school does is it pulls the middle school away from the street um, we can also look at that playground that is uh, land water conservation funded. We can look at relocating that away from the street as well. Um, we are able to, when we put the middle school on the, um, the soccer field, we are able to then relocate it where um, those fields are right now next to that play area, but we'd have to relocate those fields somewhere else. And then last but not least, um, not in the priority list, but just indicating um, G, sorry, G, E3, my apologies, um, is of the three options, the only one that provides a new um, building consideration, provides the new, a new middle school, um, and provides selected scope at the elementary and high school to minimize replacing work if the schools are replaced in the future. So that's what we're essentially solving with these three options. Did that address or clarify things? Thank you so much for putting this together yeah. in short order. And um, we talked today, you know, we need to tell the, the story about what we need to solve for and what do these, what do these various design options do to address those. And so I think this is a great start. Um, we need to probably think about how to edit it a bit for people mm -hmm. who aren't familiar, members of the, the general public. I think a lot of people will understand a lot of it, but some of it won't, won't make yep. sense. So we'll have I to agree with that. The language when you put this together in short order, so that's uh, kudos to you. I guess the only question I had may, may not be possible. I think the only thing that could maybe make it better is if somehow you could put dollar figures next to parts of these uh, projects. I, don't, I know it's sort of part and parcel with it's hard to isolate necessarily some of those costs, but. Yeah. Um, he was asking for if we could put dollar amounts next to kind dollar of amounts, like the investment in, uh, you know, the repairs at the elementary school and middle school. Is there a dollar figure associated with those? Yeah. Some of these we can, like repairs is an easy one, easier one for us. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier because <laughs> They are itemized items. Um, when we get into things that are integrated into renovation expansion, it's hard to pull those apart. Of course. Um, 
but um, we, we can definitely uh, do some of that. And you'll see later in the presentation there are some, some dollar figures with some of that repair information. I would okay. Lisa, B and C, can we assume when we're looking at the repairs there that we're going to have all new windows? If we go with B or C, does that include all new windows for both buildings? I have to go back and triple check that. I believe so. I just want to make sure that it's in the zero to six time frame in the repair list because that's ultimately what's carried in this one. I think we've got a pretty detailed quote from a you do. window company yeah. that, that could do that. So hopefully that, that might be an easy thing for you to get from, from I think, either Dr. Record or, Dr. or David Begdes area. Yeah. No, we've had conversation. I just um, don't want to go on the record saying yes without confirming that that's a specific line in there. I'm 99% sure. Same question for roofs. I know roofs are in there. Roofs that are in need of repair are in there. I know um, Melissa and our office work closely um, uh, with David to go through and look at each section when it had been replaced, when it hadn't been replaced. And then we have in the repair, there is a line item for each one of those sections. And so if, if it's repair falls between year zero and six, it's in that repair. Yeah. Um, one, one other question. Have you had a chance yet to meet with the, the band directors and the, the music directors? We haven't yet. We are setting up, um, we've been using a lot of the information from principals as well as done in the previous programming. We are in the process of setting up staff-wide conversations um, and being accessible to um, both the middle school, elementary, and high school staff. Um, we have one with the high school next week. Um, I believe we even have one tomorrow with um, middle school um, and elementary school, I believe, is next week. Okay. I had met with um Melissa Shabo and Mike, can you just pull that? All right, I'm sorry. I had met a few weeks back after we had some early views of the possibilities just to get a reality check if it, if it made sense. And they had a lot of really great feedback. Good. But it would be best coming direct from them. Yeah, no, we'd love to sit down with them and, and we can ask the principal to set something up or we can just meet with them after that meeting. They were excited. So good. That's good. I think this is probably more of a question for Chris because as I as I look at this and the fact that you're all meeting with staff over the next few weeks, we, uh, as I and this is great because it starts me thinking about okay what will that school environment feel like, what is it going to help um, students achieve, and. Um, when I think about spaces and I think about collaboration and I think about how we want to be preparing students for um, the future, that I go, um, does this allow for, and I'm going to just throw uh, uh, robotics out as an example, because that's a real collaborative uh, type of of, uh, I would think, classroom environment or whatever. Um, I'd like to know from the teachers and the staff as they look at these um, um, kind of uh, needs that we're addressing, if they had, if they look at these, what is, what are the pros, what is it going to allow them to offer more of and what are the challenges that it, uh, it's going to limit certain things uh, from occurring? Because um, as I look at as I look at E3, I, as I said, I look at think about what the classroom environments are going to feel like, what the gathering spaces are going to feel like, what the teaming is going to feel like, um, and so how far are we going to get toward those things uh, in the classrooms without going to E3? I want to know what the teachers think of um, the challenges and pros of each of these. Penny, I, I couldn't have said that better. I think it's wonderful that Harriman's turning back into the schools to talk to our staff. Um, they are the experts in education. They work in these buildings every day. They work with our students. 
So we need to hear from them what they like about these plans and what they w don't like. Um, so I think you're wise to think about it in that way and I'm sure Emily and Lisa will ask those sorts of questions. So I appreciate that. I know we've all invested hundreds of hours into this work and I appreciate that. But I also want to realize we have educational experts and teachers. What could, you, and what could they do more of? If I look at some of these uh, B plus or C minus or E three, if I look at um, if I look at C minus, if I had just one more thing, we could do this. Yep. And uh, so I, think I that's I, great. I'd, I'd really like to know that. I would too. We'll, we'll incorporate that in our um, talk with them this week and next. And we're intentionally meeting with them this week and next so that we can hopefully incorporate any of the feedback we get before we meet with you guys on Thursday and we have that data to be able to um, put into any modifications that need to happen. So just process-wise, I know you have a lot more to go through in terms yeah. of taking these words and showing us the visuals and plans. So I don't know if we're ready to move on to... Any other questions before I move on? Okay. I love Excel tables, but pictures and diagrams are way, way better. Um, just wanted to make sure I address this. It's come up in every meeting. Um, we had a data point about, you know, cars and buses and queuing and all of that. And somebody asked, well, what about, multiple people asked, what about pedestrians and bike access? We just wanted to let people know we heard you. Um, and that we are working to investigate this further. Um, we understand that further investigation is required into the current path from Murray Drive neighborhood, as that's currently used for access, but no um, easement appear appears to exist. So we need to be kind of careful as to what we're connecting to. Um, there may be some implied paths, and then there are some um, probably maintained paths. Um, so we're trying to understand um, uh, and get our arms wrapped around what are the maintained areas and sort of um, encouraged areas versus maybe ones that people have just created over time. Um, and the majority of walkers and bikers appear to originate from the northeast of the site. The current sidewalks on site um, uh, could be upgraded and widened to create a multi-use path from Scott Dyer Road into the facility and adequate internal crossing, raised crossings, um, with them be incorporated into the site to provide access to each of the schools. And so that's what our civil team is doing as they work through these options. Um, they're also looking for basketball court locations. Um, there were some that I didn't like the location of based on stuff we knew, so we went back and revised those, and we didn't want to release them until we had the options. Um, Lisa, can I make one comment um, where you've said the majority of walkers and bikers are originated from the northeast of the site? Um, and that probably is true now, coming from the Brentwood neighborhoods and the Elizabeth Park neighborhoods. I know there are people who would like to walk that are from neighborhoods sort of south of the high school, just south of the high school, or potentially over Shore Road. Mm -hmm. um, but the access is very difficult and dangerous. Mm. So I think, you know, part of what people who have asked us to look more into pedestrian and bike access to the schools are asking for is a better, safer route from other neighborhoods mm -hmm. other than the two that we know are walking to school. Because mm -hmm. I think the, there's like a, is it a one mile radius that's for buses that, you know, so if, if a student lives beyond um, a one mile radius, you know, they're eligible for bus transportation mm -hmm. according to school board policy. But I think you know, I know we're looking now, the majority is the Northeast, but I think it's worthwhile to look at that whole radius of potential walkers. Okay. So one mile is the potential radius. I believe that's the school board policy. And because I think, you know, there probably are people in other neighborhoods that would if they felt like they had a safer path. Okay. Lisa. Any feedback you can provide us on which neighborhoods those are or what you've heard would be helpful too, okay. just so that we can kind of pinpoint that, but go ahead, yeah. And if, if you get a chance, and you can circle back with me at the start of the week if you'd like, or, or next week at some point, council will be receiving a presentation on the town center intersection on Monday mm -hmm. evening about some safety and pedestrian improvements that we'll be doing that will shorten up the, uh, the pedestrian crossing here at the end of Shore Road, uh, yeah. as well as uh, integrating a pedestrian crossing from Cumberland Farms over to the opposite side of 77, as well as giving a diet to the short, uh, to the Scott Dyer Road. Basically that whole 
four square intersection is going to be uh, reconfigured and uh, with a, a, a significant amount of pedestrian improvements. So if you want to take a look Great. at that and have a chat with me about it, yeah. we I'd can talk to about that too. Do that and then get our civil stuff. engineer involved in that as well. So yeah. we can. No, we're happy, happy to explore that further. Okay. Perfect. And then uh, we're also looking at some uh, works on the, on the Brentwood neighborhood, some, uh, some pedestrian crossing improvements mm -hmm. as well, uh, because it's where they cross is not where the pedestrian markings are. So we've got that in this year's budget too. So we can have a chat about that. If that'd be helpful as you mm -hmm. go forward too. It, it would, it'd be good for us to know what is happening. I mean, with the project, essentially we go to the, the edge of the, the site for the school. Um, and that's kind of where it stops, but then where do we meet up with what the, the town's doing and, and how do we make sure that there's um, a good plan? Yeah. Okay. All right, let's dive in. So um, this was B, as you saw it um, uh, on the 15th. Um, and so uh, this is the, um, for those just chiming in, this is Scott Dyer Road up here. This is our elementary, middle, and high school. Um, down at the bottom is a key to tell you if it's um, existing building, um, demolition, renovation, high school addition, middle school addition, or elementary school addition. And then this was our prioritized list, um, and th the bubbles essentially talk about a rough percentage of the amount um, that we're able to satisfy those priorities. I will remind folks that this is looking at the priorities for elementary, middle, and high school when these bubbles are filled in. Um, and then this is the summary of the scope um, here. I'm not gonna go over this in great detail. I just want this here so people remember what it was. B plus, um, so I'll go back. You can see that yellow bar grows. It's one of the biggest differences. There's a little bit additional renovation in here as well, but that is the biggest difference. Um, we'll update the table once we get further into the options, um, but the summary for B plus you heard me talk about a lot of it in that table I just went through. Um, so these bullets on screen um, really, again, capture what was gone over in that table. The table probably has even more information than what this does. But in general, we're addressing repairs at elementary middle school. We have the cafeteria um, for a separate cafeteria for the elementary middle school. Remind folks that was one of the highest priorities. Um, and then um, we're addressing safety and security. We have a new admin addition, um, and we are renovating the existing cafeteria um, to be a performing arts area and have various renovations throughout the school. Um, so this is zooming in on what B was and what B plus is. So essentially you have that second floor this was B, this is B existing, so this is what it is today with the graphic, with the key. This is what B was on the first floor. And now this says that this is still under draft. So this is the one option, as I mentioned, that we don't have the square footage for tonight. Um, we call it a Rubik's Cube of programming. So going back and figuring out the Rubik's Cube for this option, making sure we have the SPED programming correct, um, is what is happening right now. But the, the major difference, you can see this plan has been updated. Oh, did I jump? No, this is, yep, yeah. okay. So what we were able to do, you can see, let's see if I can find my pointer. this bar right here. In this one, it's a lot of admin functions. Um, in the revised one, we're doing a second story up here. Um, so we're able to, um, I'm sorry. I jumped. So now I'm on the second B. These are now more special education programs. So we're able to have them more centralized um, in that bar. Um, these are some of the smaller programs, not the ones integrated into the classroom. Um, wings per se, some of the smaller service pr providers. Um, and then we were able to um, incorporate different administration programming throughout. 
Um, this is existing second floor and then indicating that lower level of the 1930s building. And so this is the big um, difference. Uh, B did not have a second floor and now B plus does have a second floor. Um, and we were able to get a lot, and this is again what we're confirming that we're able to get all of them, um, is a lot of the special education programming that we're able to clarify. Um, and not to say there isn't special education program throughout the rest of it, these colors indicate areas that are either being added. So if there's that red box around, it's added square footage. If it's colored in the plan, it's renovated. Um, so this looks at renovating the wayfinding spaces um, in the elementary and middle school, providing several special education spaces up here um, that can be accessed from both sides. So one half is more geared towards middle school, other half more towards um, uh, the elementary school programming. And one thing we did do is um, remove the room that was right here in between these classrooms and relocated that program. So there is a um, collaboration area outside these middle school classrooms. Um, so we were able to do that in the seventh grade wing and the eighth grade wing. Question regarding um, the special ed programming mm -hmm. on, uh, located on the second floor. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had any conversations with this, is there any concern, first of all, about accessibility for people that may have uh, physical disabilities or mm -hmm. challenges re reaching the programming on the second floor? And also any concern about um, <clears throat> just sort of consolidating everything in one area and yeah, so that or it's not, perception? yep, no, excellent question. Um, it's not all consolidated in one area. These were the programs, um, some of them that came up from the lower level. Um, and there are still special education dispersed throughout the school. Um, it's hard because we can't show all the colors, but like this, so if you think about um, how we said we need one, two, three, four, five, these six classrooms, um, this here uh, could either be a world language or a special education space. Um, so we kind of have that flex to be able to move those around, but we have the count for all those different ones. Um, so we have a special education and dispersed in those classroom wings. So it's not all right there, um, but some of these are, um, I think, social worker um, guidance, things like that, um, that are up in this area. What we liked about them being right here is now they're more centrally located right above. I mean, guidance being above the cafeteria is probably ideal. That's where most of the things happen they need to deal with, um, that and the playground. Um, so. Um, but that's definitely something we can, can review um, again with special education and just make sure that there isn't any concern to that. We do have accessibility to that. So we have to have accessibility to that second floor regardless of what program's up there. Lisa? Yes. One of the things you're accomplishing with this, and I think I'd like to see you highlight a little more, is with B plus, you're getting, you're not addressing the cafeteria improvements. You're getting new cafeterias in the oh, yeah. kitchen. So I think as we're trying to communicate just I think we might as well take advantage of some of the things that we're really getting done in a big way. Mm -hmm. We're actually getting new cafeterias and a new yep. a new kitchen. Yep. And we could we could clarify that to addressing cafeteria improvements with new elementary middle school calf or yeah, something. Because that's been one of our biggest hot buttons for years. Yep. Whether it's new or just separate, making sure that they're not together. Absolutely. I have a question, one, but I think Dave has a one, We're thing, too. one thing that came up in an earlier meetings, we were talking about firewalls. There was quite a bit of discussion. Whatever happened with that? Are we is, is the design affecting it at all? Or we're going to have to renovate. We're going to have to incorporate um, those firewalls we talked about. So there's going to be renovation, you know, in here, in here, in here, over here. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to open up walls, and we're going to have to address that. Otherwise, I mean, there's just too much building square footage here not to do that. Okay. And the next thing, this is just something where you got existing build, building, demolition, renovation. Yeah. Is it possible to have a different kind of color in there? They're so alike, you can't really. Yeah, we're, we're struggling with demolition. <laughs> um, I mean, the white is easy because it's the existing, and then the dark renovation, the demo is the one. I mean, when you typically demo a building, you almost see through it, but then we see the background and it's getting dark. So we'll, we'll go back and revisit that, but I agree. The demolition is the hardest one to really decipher 
There's not much demolition in this one, so you're probably not really seeing it. Um, but when we look at the next one, if it's still not clear, we can go back and, and try again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Lisa? Yeah. Uh, when do you think you'll be able to have the square footage on here for the next meeting? Or? Uh, before then. Before um, then? I think we can get uh, these slides updated before that meeting so people have it. I know that's an important thing people want to see. Right. Um, I know that our team is um, hoping to confirm it tomorrow, but I don't want to promise it tomorrow. I would say probably Monday. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I had two quick questions, but Corinne, did you? Okay. Um, it, just for clarification, in this option, the mm -hmm. 1934 building um, remains as is ish. Mm -hmm. And to with programming, uh, looking to pull programming as much as we can up out of that lower level. And two, I guess, could you speak to at all how much or how little um, the general disconnected sprawling nature of the middle school is, 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 it, is dealt with or is it just kind of not in this case? It's, it's really not um, uh, dealt with in this option. I think that people, uh, you know, folks who don't have kids in the school, it, it's hard to uh, understand just how far that, that walk from the, the middle school is down. That, that hallway doesn't look very long in this graph, but uh, yeah, it, I was it is. trying to remind myself what yeah. it feels like. So, so really the middle school remains kind of as is, but we have the new cafeteria. Um, you have a new cafeteria. And, and then the new floor, that's, that's substantial. The two floor, the two floor the building. The two floor addition. Yep. You also have um, we call it wayfinding. So those gray renovation squares that you see in different areas, um, we are intentionally renovating those spaces um, to help with the wayfinding aspect. It's not going to help with the distance, but another challenge of both of these schools is understanding where you're at in the school and how to navigate within the school. Um, and there's a lot we can do with changing of finishes in those areas, graphics, color, all of that to assist with that. But it, to your exact question, it does not address the sprawling nature. This does have yeah. a new main entry though, right? The, it has a new main entry um, in the location of um, the existing. Yep. And so the, uh, the, main entry, the main entry point is pretty, pretty separated from the body of the school. In that case, correct as it is right now. So this is the main entrance to the element to the middle school. This is the main entrance to the elementary and B plus. You'll see a different uh, approach in C minus. How much square? Uh, how uh, Lisa, this is uh, Larry, Larry Benoit. Uh, Hi, Larry. Oh, could I be recognized? Okay. Um, in looking at the uh, schematic here. Um, the uh, cafeteria is at midpoint of both of the buildings. It seems to me that one of the real benefits comes from that location is it does in fact reduce substantially the amount of distance that students have to walk to go to the cafeteria. And additionally, if we're going to incorporate um, some uh, gathering space and collaborative learning space to get dual use out of the um, cafeteria, that's another benefit. And then thirdly, I did want to ask a question uh, regarding sizing of the cafeteria, and that is, um, are you um, going to size for two or three um, meal sessions a day? Uh, we're currently sizing for three. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. The uh, Colby Simons design was about 15,000 square feet for the cafeteria for, for um, three, and it was about 17,000 for two. Is the footprint roughly that? I know you're going to give us uh, yeah, square footage. I, I don't. I don't know off the top of my head, Larry, okay. what that is. Okay, thank you, Lisa. But, yep. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, that screen is up there. Can you remind us all of the classrooms that are white up there, from Pond Cove all the way through the middle school that are white? What happens in those classrooms? Repair. Just repair. Yep. In HVA, where we've determined that we need to replace HVAC, and so in and so. terms of educational programming and addressing our needs that way, nothing's happening in those rooms. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Corinne, go ahead. Um, we had discussed some options for what could happen in the old cafetorium once that's no longer being used for food service. Mm -hmm. um, have you explored if? 
I know we talked about maybe it could be used for music or maybe, you know, because of the kind of odd tiered design, you could maybe compartmentalize spaces that could be used for something else. I don't mm -hmm. know what, but has your team explored? That's this? the next, once we get through these three iterations, um, they're eager to dive into that and really study that in detail um, to understand, A, how many seats could we, you know, provide in there? How would, how would all that f operate? The tiered is challenging. Um, the ramping is challenging outside of that space. Um, so there's, um, yes, it's a large space, but it does come with some challenges. The stage is pretty high, um, but um, definitely eager to dive in and, and really look at all the potential that that has. Um, but that's the next level of iteration um, once we get these, um, especially B, settled down with the square footage that they wanna start digging into that. Um, I did want to comment on something Larry said. Larry, you, you are correct that this helps with the um, distance to the cafeteria, but um, understand the middle school in this option is still coming in at the same point, so there's still that distance. Um, and the elementary school still has to go back to the same location for gym. So as it does help, um, it hasn't hasn't necessarily addressed that they don't have to still make that distance, um, but it does help with the distance to the cafeteria. And where is the nurse? Oh. That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> the nurse is in adjacent to the admin. So the orange section. Nice. Correct, Thank yeah. You. And we kind of have the two nurses back to back, so if there is any need to do double duty, because we know sometimes that happens and you're understaffed. I had pretty much the same question as Corinne, but I wanted to recommend before you fill in those details, I already mentioned it once, but meeting with the, um, the teachers in, yeah. in that department, because they had some pretty specific uh, requests with respect to l the layout there, given the size of the band, for example, how large of a space they would need to ha host the, the entire band together, things of that nature. Yep, um, perfect. And I guess we'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm curious what sort of budget is being assigned uh, to, to the auditorium in this case. And, and um, uh, when will we see more details on that? In next week or not? No, not next week. So next week is where we refine the scope and then it goes to the cost estimator. So we would get Sorry, the cost for the options we are getting to you guys prior to the community forum. Would generally the idea though be that it would be sort of a flexible space um, similar to what we saw at the South Portland Middle School where it's you bring chairs in or would it be more of a, a fixed um, Takes don't don't, don't know, know at this point right now there's a dollar per square foot assigned to that space um, in regards to a, a, a renovation of that whole space um, but I think it would come down to speaking to the individuals that um, you talked about I would I would think you would want it to be more flexible just because I mean Absolutely. performing art space is awesome but there that's a one one use um, and so the flexibility would allow you guys to have a lot more collaboration space Exactly, that was my bias too. But yeah. the last question on that, with the tiers, is there any way to flatten it out to make it a, a flat? Um, there is, the challenge is that hallway at the back is one level and the hallway in the front is another. So even if we flatten it out, now we need to take up room internally to get ramps up to that. Yeah. Um, nothing's impossible, there's just trade-offs. Okay, that's all I ask, thank you. Le yep. Lisa, the couple of quick questions. The the two small little brown boxes that are at the bottom, they look like additional admin. Is, was there just not enough space in, out front for all the admin to be together, or what was the thinking behind? Right now, those are used as um, conference spaces. Okay. Conference and guidance, I believe, is what they were. So we utilize that space because we had it. We could add on to the addition and put them out there and turn that over to storage. It's a very internal space, um, so, so, no, so no windows or anything. Yeah, I mean it's that balance between making sure we don't want to oversize things because obviously additions, it's it's uh, more um, just more cost when you add more square footage. Um, but we could we could squeeze those into that and change that configuration slightly. So the only other question I had is when we went to Lyseth, yeah, they had that. 
beautiful space that they built out front for the entrance. Mm -hmm. And they had that really secure, safe. It, when we're, we're looking at this, our entrances, a big part of what we w really wanted to prioritize was safety. Yes. We're going to be looking at, from a costing out standpoint, that similar kind yes. of safe, yep. you know, yeah, approach to get in the double vestibule, the vestibule doors with the hardened um, yeah. walls between admin, all of that. Yep, that's all priced in there. Okay, Correct. that'd be great. Yep. Visibility. That yep, and, and that's why we're trying. We've created the way we have so that they have better visibility out that way. The admin is always that one where we're constantly trying, and and we we wrestled with it some on the new middle school but we got it um, and we had to flip things many times <laughs> but the I, the thing is is with the admin you want to have that full cone of vision you need to in order to react you need to see what's coming yeah um, they, were, they were talking about line of sight and absolutely how critical that was absolutely on the, on the same category though does this how does this address the 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 front entrance being more secure is is, is important and wonderful, but there's a lot of doors mm -hmm. into the existing building as it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, does this do anything to those doors? Um, I have to double check the scope. Typically what we'll do is alarm those doors and monitor them electronically um, because the biggest um, way to uh, uh, behavior um, of internal folks usually will trump any secure perimeter. You prop open a door and it's, you know. <laughs> this, this does address the cafeteria though also. It addresses right, right the, now the weakest, service. The weakest security piece we have is people delivering stuff at the back of the middle school yeah. and traipsing all the way through the school. With this, you don't show it here, but we, we'd show a back uh, way into the cafeteria to deliver all that stuff is we don't show it here but we show it in the yeah, you can see it I in the 3d rendering so that that addresses one of the biggest security yeah. issues we have it, it addresses a security issue for sure I, I mean there's lots of them but to your point I mean all schools have lots of doors on the exterior it's about monitoring them some schools remove hardware on the outside so that there's only certain doors that you can actually go into from the outside um, key cards things like that um, I'll go back and double check the perimeter door um, scope in this specific option and the other ones too, just to see what it's carried. Lisa. Uh, Lisa, a question about sound isolation. Um, in regard to the auditorium, presently it's, it's isolated for the most part, but um, if it were to be used regularly for band practice, for example, or orchestra, uh, could it be sufficiently isolated from the admin offices? Uh, well, sorry. I should plug in um, my computer so it stops going. Um, uh, so you're you're asking. So if um, right now, I mean, your, your band is you have your band performing. You know, your space up here right now. If they're in the performing area, your question is how is sound isolated to the admin? With the admin being an addition, we can do a lot in the wall between the addition and the existing building to address. Because we're gonna have to have a firewall there anyway. We can address acoustics that way. Um, you do have um, a space between, which is the hallway that helps. Um, we can't, you know, in an existing, I shouldn't say we can't, but it is harder to make it um, so the sound will not leave that space in a renovation, but there's a lot of things we can do um, to help mitigate um, sound transfer to other spaces. But to your point, the only thing next to this is really the admin and the gymnasium. Um, so making sure that we make sure that wall of that admin addition is uh, built with that in mind and with it being a firewall, it's going to have to be. I know okay, there's plenty more time, and Cindy, I know you have a question. Um, plenty more time for questions and potential concerns, yep. but my biggest right now is proximity of the main office to the rest of the building. So I'm curious when we get to the other options tonight. Yes. C plus or C minus, C minus. E3, where it is and yep. how that enhances that. Yep, absolutely. Cindy, go ahead. Uh, and my question actually was very similar to Larry's. I was worried about, I, was, I wanted to ask about the sound transfer, any concerns with that between the cafeteria and the special ed place, spaces, especially mm -hmm. if you're looking at things like guidance and social work where you want a particularly quiet environment mm -hmm. um, is yeah. there concern about sound from the cafeteria we just have to we have to be uh, we have to specify a different assembly between the cafeteria um, and up above in regards to acoustics 
um, and we have to make sure that we're, we're very diligent about that. Um, so we would just have to take a different approach. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I was just thinking about how the hallways slope. D does your admin have to step down? Because <laughs> I can't remember how many slopes and plateaus there are in that hallway. Is each door at a different height? The the auditorium has four tiers. It does step down. So there is um, the middle school admin is slightly higher elevation wise. They're not connected internally. Yeah. Um, and then the elementary does have to be lower because of, of those entry points. Good. All right. Um, in regards to the admin, we varied it on all of them. So you'll see uh, several different approaches. Right. Yep. Um, so this is existing, we talked about these already. High school, we left all the scope on the high school TBD. Um, so as, as we go through this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, and not because it's not important, but I wanna get to the detail of the options in C minus and E3. The data is here, broken down later in the presentation as to what, what it means for, um, uh, what is renovation, what is addition, what's included. Um, it's, it's, inc it's identified at a high level. If you have questions, please feel free and ask. But wanted to provide the dollar breakdown. You can see the repair for the high school option here is about $15.5 million. Renovation's about $2 million. I'm using round figures intentionally. These are rough order magnitude costs. So total, um, we have about you know, 18 and a quarter to 18, or 17 and, and um, a quarter to 17 and a half million dollars. And then we broke down the repair, zero to three, three to six. Um, and you can see those figures. Um, and um, we also included the six to 10, just so you can see there's other things, like just because we address levels of repair doesn't mean we've addressed everything. There will be other things that come up. It's just the nature of buildings and systems that exist they will need to retire and be replaced and all of that. So just wanted to have that there for a reference point. Um, existing floor plan at the high school. Um, so the big things addressed and be originally um, for the high school um, was the cafeteria, the satellite dining, um, the uh, acoustic separation um, and several of the classroom spaces uh, throughout the school and, and various other items. Um, again, not in trying to um, uh, go over um, the high school um, because quickly because it's not important, it is, but just trying to get into the detail scope that we have tonight. Um, C, um, so C, you can see here on the screen, Scott Dyer Road, um, just by the coloring, you can see that there's more renovation that was happening at C than B originally. Um, we had separate admin additions. We had that two-story um, cafeteria um, addition, um, and then the high school um, work was starting to show some, some additions for some of the athletic programming. Um, so C minus, um, You'll see when I flip back and forth, this is the original C, this is the new C. The big differences are we got rid of these little additions here and here. The um, renovation, the addition here, we took a different approach and put the um, uh, music band programs here um, in the one here, you can see the yellow. Um, and the admin is a slightly different configuration. Um, we did still need to keep this addition to get the number to right size the kindergarten classrooms because they are 20% undersized um, and um, slightly different um, layout of the admin. This is just zooming in. So middle school enters over here. Um, what this allows us to do is bring the admin and the entry more central to the middle of the middle school. 
Um, we set it up so that uh, trying to create a, a main street through the wayfinding renovations, because you have your gymnasium here, your library here, your cafeteria here. So really this axis over here sets you up for all those public spaces right past the middle school entry. How does that, how does that affect the playground? Sorry, wrong scheme. On the playground, you lose that field. You lose that field. It needs to be relocated. And where would we be putting it over? You'd have to put it off-site. Okay. And that's the same in E3 as well. Okay. I apologize. I was on the uh, wrong slide earlier. Same idea, though, by putting this admin here, we create that, that main street for this addition. Um, gem, library, cafeteria. Um, do this do does... we have ideas of where off-site that, that could go? Are there land, public lands not, not defined? No. Not the present time. It's used a lot. Oh, it sure is. Yeah. And Lisa, what about uh, cost for um, moving that field? Are you going to be giving us a number, just a generic number to do that? Um, we would have to make an assumption on uh, whether you own a site or purchasing a site, and then we would have to give, we would give a rough order of magnitude cost on creating similar um, athletic uh, facilities in a, a different location. Okay, I think that's an important cost element that we really are going to need mm -hmm. for this uh, for this project as well as uh, the E the E options. Yep, agreed. Um, this removes um, the music program here and rebuilds the function closer to the pr um, the existing uh, cafeteria that's renovated uh, to be performing arts. Um, this also utilizes the 1934 building as um, a school program. Um, and then you have the elementary school entrance um, over here. So this is the existing um, uh, floor plan, middle school entry, elementary. Um, this was the original C. You can see all the red boxes indicate the additions. And this is revised C, known as C minus. We are able to provide square footages on this. You can see them at the upper left-hand corner of the slide. Um, walk you through this. We have, um, this actually is in the wrong location. The um, entrance is right here. Um, so we'll move that uh, triangle to right here. The main entrance is here. Um, we have our administration um, uh, suite. We come in, we have a, um, a receiving area that we can renovate to be similar to those that maybe visited Lyseth, um, uh, to have a collaboration um, wayfinding hub there, and then another one down here. Um, we would have a renovation for a STEM program here. We would come around, um, we have um, uh, renovation in this space and then an opening to the cafeteria. Um, this also could be a collaboration area. This is a renovation expansion for the for the music band and chorus adjacent to where the performing arts would be. Um, and then um, we were able, you can see in this one where we've started to renovate spaces for special ed, you can see that um, these have um, the coloring and more of a integrated um, approach um, in those areas. Um, a jump over to the elementary, elementary entrance, admin come in. We have um, the old admin renovated to become a sped flex room. Um, so this is that six classroom plus one so that SPED program is a similar size to a classroom. If this ever needed seven classrooms, which we see a bubble where that is needed, um, we are able to relocate this program maybe to a classroom wing that has less grades that year, and we can use this as a classroom. Um, and then in the uh, kindergarten, we have right-sized um, these classrooms and provided the number of classrooms needed. And then you can see these little spaces that are starting to pop in here, here. We're starting to integrate those small group one-on-one -on -one spaces um, in the learning communities. Um, at the elementary on C minus, this renovates to become a STEM area off the library. 
Um, and this um, is a teacher workroom. And then this is access to the cafeteria. Answer, but um, there's there's the, there's a good reason why you're probably not putting a possible entry off of Scott Dyer Road for the middle school. Is that because of a lack of bus space? And is that another you, you'll see in the next option we do it when we just have E. Um, right now, your kitchen deliveries are coming in that way too. You're going to have a little bit of congestion in that one spot for all of it to happen. Um, we did explore it, and that was what was happening, because, I mean, right here would be a nice spot, but you also have your deliveries coming in here, and it gets, right. gets a little tight with this building right here. When this goes away, you'll see that we, and the other option, have an entrance over on this side coming off of Scott Dyer. Does this renovation address the 1930s building egress issues and barrier-free issues? Um, yes, this, the renovations, uh, part of the repair addresses the ADA um, aspects of that, yes. About the egress. And the egress, yep. Lisa, can you remind us in this solution, what happens with the classrooms that are in the 600 square foot, 600 to 700 square foot range or the low 700 square foot range? Anything, adjustments to walls or making those bigger, enhancing the ability to have collaborative space within classrooms? Um, no, um, the existing square footage of um, these spaces remains, remains the same. Um, the option C in the elementary, we have the ability to open up walls between here. Um, in the middle school, we do not. Um, we can only open up a certain percentage of that wall. Um, so these these classrooms here remain the size that they are, but what we did do is take out that, that admin um, area in the middle to at least open up this space so they do have a place to um, kind of push out into the hallway. Um, but you still have some classrooms that are um, the existing size that, that they are. When you're in that gray area, that collaborative space, that, mm -hmm. um, is there a way to get did you put natural light into that area? Is that part of the... The intention is that each one of those would have natural light. Obviously, on the lower level, we can't do that, but the upper level, we can. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, we, wayfinding with natural light is one of the best ways to enhance those areas. Centralizing things, bringing up things up to two floors, are there energy efficiencies that factor into a layout like this? relative to what's there today? Any of the new areas? I mean, we can go in and do, um, you know, the addition areas, um, especially the cafeteria with the two stories. Um, the smaller the footprint, um, the less exterior wall, the better insulated exterior wall, um, and the better systems, there will be efficiencies based on that program there. Um, overall, you're adding square footage, so you're, it's gonna be, you're gonna negate any of those savings because you're gonna you know, pay to, to keep, keep those up. Um, but any of the new areas will be built to the current energy codes and, and beyond. Tim raised a good question about replacing windows. Yep. Um, which would increase, uh, obviously, our value, but yep. anything we're doing with the existing walls similar to Michael's asking yep. the R value of our current walls? Yep. In several areas, we are, uh, part of the repair is replacing areas of that because they are in such, um, there are some areas just in, in bad shape. Um, it's, it's hard to say wholeheartedly yes everywhere because it's in the repair, it's more pocketed areas uh, across the building. Um, there is not in these options a wholesale you know, adding insulation to all the exterior walls. That would require all new finishes interior or all new finishes exterior. Um, so um, really looking to, to invest in the new areas um, and it would take a lot of, lot of scope and a lot of money to do that other area as well. Sorry to keep asking questions. That's what I'm here for. And I think this is a question Patrick would ask, um, but as we open these walls to renovate 
there's a risk on what we'll find. Correct. Can you remind the public and all of us what that risk is and what, what that means for us? Yep. Money. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all of this means money. It's like, <laughs> um, to, no. to be like more specific about that, have you like estimated a dollar amount no, about yeah, that's uh, they're unforeseen. That the whole challenge. In I feel it. like the 1934 building in particular. I feel a lot of anxiety about what will happen if you renovate that building. That um, you'd be surprised what we find in 1980 buildings. I mean, it's it, the things we find. They're head scratchers. Um, we don't. That's that's the that's the risk of renovating. We don't know what we're gonna find, and when we open that wall and we see it, we have to address it. Therefore, your money that we think might be going to renovating the performing arts, I'm just picking something, I'm not saying it's gonna be that, may then have to go address whatever we just found instead of the performing arts, for example. Um, so that, that, is, that is definitely a risk that we run with renovation, and we, if, if we could estimate that, um, we'd be doing uh, a completely different business. Um, you just can't. Um, that's why we make sure we have healthy contingencies, but I can tell you that um, in some renovations, you just, you, sometimes it's unsuitable soils, sometimes it's things in the wall that come out, it's wiring that is not up to code and now we're replacing it everywhere. This is a true story that we've lived together in a project. Um, and we already had a stripped down scope and budget and it just, it, it, lack of a better term, it's sad because we're trying to deliver something for the community and the students and the teachers and we're saying you're gonna get X and all of a sudden we find all these things and now we have to start trimming back scope to take that money because as soon as we go to referendum, we're set the budget. Where would you rank us as like, a, like would you rank this as a, a high, I don't know, like, like a, a, a bill, I mean, I know you can't predict the future or anything, but in your experience, like, where, what, what, where is our, you were rating us like a credit agency <laughs> or something, <laughs> like, what's the risk of this project facing those type of issues? It, it's, it's a risk. We can't say if it's high, if it's low, if it's medium until, I mean, until we open walls. Um, we can't see behind the walls. We can't see, you know, in all the crevices of this building. Um, I can tell you right now, there's going to be, you know, a lot of work we're going to have to do to get the, the fire rating in those areas we've identified um, done. And that's going to be cost that goes into the walls, not into the programming. What about the electrical where it's coming in? It's all the main feed where it comes in. Is there going to be a lot of work on that or can we use a lot of the existing? Do you know yet? Um, I need to circle back. Our electrical looked at that, uh, especially as we're looking at where we were doing different renovations, because it's coming in off of Scott Dyer. It's coming like right up over here. Right. Um, and, um, you know, a, a lot of, I have to go back and look at the scope. I don't want to say um, without uh, looking at the specifics of that. But they're looking to reuse anything they can, but things that are outdated, we have to replace. And a lot of that would be captured in that repair. Okay. Um, if it was outdated and we can't find replacement parts, which happens a lot in buildings of this age, um, and that would be captured captured there. Yep. Lisa, can you? Yeah. We're going to get to E very soon, I think. Um, so this relates to that. But in terms of impact on current students and mm. staff, they've got to live, work, and, and play through this. Yeah. What does C minus, for instance, mean for our kindergarten through eighth grade? Mm. In terms of years, in terms of where we put them all. Because yep. there's a lot going on there. There's a lot. Um, so occupied renovations extend construction schedules um, because we have to move students and staff around. Unless we can move everybody off site for the whole duration of this, which is m more than unlikely. I mean, we might be able to move you know, the middle school over to a vacant middle school. Um, and be able to approach from the middle school, you know, aspect first, um, but then you're gonna have to move um, elementary school students to go in and do the renovation and work in those areas. It's gonna be disruptive. Um, any, I mean, this is a, this is a major renovation um, and sizable addition. 
Um, and it's the renovation work that's more impactful than the addition work to the occupants. Um, the additions, essentially, you can do without impacting, per se, um, the individuals as much. Um, what C does better than B is the um, addition for the, for the entrance. Um, this, uh, that one pretty much goes ex exactly where you're entering the building now. Um, so that would take that offline that whole time that's being built. Um, this one, um, essentially, uh, with the middle school addition over here, um, it could be happening without impacting the existing middle school, and you could do a shared middle school elementary entrance here while this is being built. So there's different things we can do, but um, I, I would encourage folks to talk to teachers and staff at Lyseth, for example, that we all walk together, or Presumpscot that was just renovated in Portland, and it is impactful. It is disruptive. Um, renovations are disruptive. You are gonna move students. People are gonna be packing. There's coordination that happens. It's construction. Things don't always happen on time. How do you, how do you maybe this is a question for you, like, with all the construction that's going on, all the people going in and out, how do you keep your kids safe mm. in the school during all of that? Dave, I think that is of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there's all sorts of moving parts, moving trucks, moving equipment, right. moving people, and plus we need to educate them. Yeah. Which is number one. Well, safety's first, educate mm -hmm. them second. So. To, to address that, what, it, let's just say you move forward with C, hypothetically. We would sit down and do a phased um, plan, right. and we would meet with Chris and his staff, and um, sometimes we'll even consult with contractors we know that won't be doing it, or we have individuals that work with us on, on phasing from a construction lens. And we will come up with a plan as to how to um, compartmentalize the work. So we say, okay, we're gonna take this area of the school offline at this time, and these students are going possibly to portables or possibly to another school. And then we renovate that area, and then that is done, we move people back. And we kind of take it piece by piece. So a lot of the, um, uh, like Reiki in Portland, it, all interior work, we took five classrooms at a time, moved them out to portables, renovated that area of the school, moved them back. The next six months, we moved over to five classrooms, we renovated all those. The, they were out in the portables, we moved them back. So we can go about it that way. And the area between renovation and occupied has to be, there has to be uh, fire separation between that um, from a safety standpoint. And then there are things in the specifications that we'll talk about um, uh, different protocol for contractors um, in regards to safety on the campus and communication will be paramount. Um, we'll have kickoff meetings with everybody involved talking about when things need to be told to the school, um, whether there's a change in traffic patterns that they need to be aware of, um, where the laydown areas are, what major, major deliveries might be happening when. Um, you know, we've had schools that had blasting before, when that would happen to coordinate that with testing and things like that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. What's, what's the contingency percentage that you anticipate carrying? We, we typically, um, and this is, um, what the, the state would have us carry on a state project. We carry 10% um, overall, 5% bid, 5% construction. Sure. It's very low. Trust me, it gets eaten up very quickly. We can carry more, it just raises the price tag. I guess it depends on the price tag itself. It does, well, I mean, when you think about major projects, that, that number gets up there pretty big, or pretty high. There's choices that can be made along the way, depending on what's found, so. Other questions? Um, I know this option doesn't lend itself well to a master plan, like a full replacement master plan, but I know just like when I worked on schools, I did some sites that were like tight urban sites where you had no choice but to do like a tiny yep. chess match of little replacements exactly. yep. over time. Um, and so I guess I would ask your team if we could see some sort of master plan, whether it's like 20 or 40 years, 
for this option is just to ensure that we're not building something, you know, like I see especially like the small wing on the kindergarten or different, the smaller pieces to make sure that we're not building something that would really impair making another really important or good change in 20 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, um, we definitely tried to minimize those small additions. Um, I mean, we could not build that kindergarten one. We would just have really small kindergarten spaces. Um, and you would have a, um, yeah, they would be 20% undersized. So we could, we could take that off and be able to do that. Um, I guess from a, from a, sorry, master planning standpoint, I guess, could you clarify what you mean by that as to would you be looking to continue to add on to this, replace it at some point, or what are your thoughts around that? I guess m maybe that would be good feedback to know because I see like, for example, our biggest addition is the cafeteria in the middle. If you were trying to say, fully replace the middle school, you're then doing demo and just a lot of work right around your new piece of school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so some pieces might kind of inhibit good future m moves in mm -hmm. different directions. So I don't, I could see, I think that if we go in this direction, we are locking ourselves into more tiny, chess match moves mm -hmm. um, just because it's connecting things even more than they already are right now. Yeah. And that's the challenge with BNC is, is that's what it's doing. It's continuing to add on to the existing ones um, to where it doesn't make a clean break to replace one of these in the future for that same grade level configuration. Um, I mean, if if there was um, a desire that this needed to do that, we'd have to think about it you know, completely different. You wouldn't have a centralized cafeteria kitchen. Um, you would, you'd really be challenged as to where that could go. Um, uh, essentially, you'd almost have it pretty close to where the existing cafeteria is right now in regards to the available places for that. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can look at that to see if there's any, any considerations, but I think that's the nature of B and C. They are really looking at how do you do smaller moves to gain more uh, and address more of the needs. Um, and the nature of that is you don't really have it set up for that replacement if that's the desire of a master plan. Um, if you want to continue to add on to this, I mean, there are opportunities where you remove the middle school wing to be able to then add on to the fifth grade and maybe even do a courtyard scheme up there with more classrooms if that were desired. Um, but you are starting to really limit what you can do. Um, but you're, you're gaining a lot by connecting those two. Um, Circulation-wise, I always think about people who maintain the buildings or shared staff between the two, um, not having to go all the way around and back to be able to go in kind of a circular pattern across there um, and uh, cutting down on some of that um, travel time. But I, I guess that's the challenge we're seeing with this. If we had clear direction as to, hey, we want C to be able to replace one of these schools in the future, then we would take a different approach to it. Or we want C to be able to address um, X number of classrooms added to each grade level. Um, we might take a slightly different, I mean, really the only place that we're maybe shoehorning ourselves in is that kindergarten, but we would essentially just do a double loaded corridor and move that addition out maybe a little further and have a longer connector on that side, so that may be one consideration so we don't shoehorn ourselves in and being able to block the light on that other one. Yeah, I think that makes sense, and I don't know that we need, or that's part of our um, responsibility to say that we should plan to replace or whatever for this option, but I think it's a really important thing to note whenever we're summarizing each option, we say option C minus doesn't set us up to be able to like efficiently replace yeah. you know, 
we're kind of continuing the chess match yeah. we go down this. And we, we tried to emphasize that on E3 when we said it, but we can go back and emphasize that on these as well, that, that kind of signs you up for that approach. And, and if that's the approach that is decided upon, then that's the approach that is decided upon, but it's gonna make it harder, or not harder, it's, you're going to be replacing some, some of this work by removing aspects of this in the future or redoing it. Along, along your, your point, the requirement to maintain the 1934 building puts a lot of shackles on your options, does it not? Mm -hmm. We don't want to we don't want to revisit that. <laughs> I feel like I mean at least revisiting the idea of unshackling it from the school project, not necessarily demolishing it, but not having it. Well, if we demolished it, we'd have a lot more flexibility. The ball fields, losing those fields is not good. And, uh, You're gonna have to start knocking on some it's doors. It's hard to renovate to an old people building. about that. Michael. There's a lot of challenges. It's probably a good question for our Google Doc. It's a good question for Google Doc. Yes. <laughs> for our Google Doc, considering we have much more to do tonight. Yeah. The survey. I didn't. I didn't have that one. On. It would be a great question, or as part of an option. I don't know. Anyway. Let's right. discuss that another time. Too. Any other questions on C minus? I do want to get to E3, and I want to be respectful of time because it's starting to get late. And Lisa, if you need a break for a second at any time, <laughs> so, like you've been up there a long time. <laughs> you know I'm used to this. <laughs> I know. But... All right, um, let's move on. Um, okay, so we hadn't gotten to the second floor yet. Um, here's the changes. Um, this looks at getting some of the world language um, classrooms um, in spaces, uh, two of the world language classrooms. Right now in B, that is one of the programs that is not an appropriate space. One of those world language classrooms remains in an in a undersized space and shared. Um, and so this, uh, again, provides that second, second level. Um, high school, uh, same thing, we've provided the table um, we provided information. Um, we can start to summarize um, uh, different um, uh, ideas um, to float out to everybody as to maybe ways to approach um, of that scope, but really need um, some clarification on, on how we want to proceed there. Um, the difference when we got to see um, the library uh, received a renovation and the testing um, area um, and large group meeting space. And again, none of these high school things need to remain in any of these options. You can take parts and pieces of them and move them to different ones. Um, we, we did try really hard when we went through the high school to itemize that, and you'll see that in the cost. Um, this also looks at, um, this is the existing third floor. Um, C, um, the C option uh, looked at addressing a lot of the acoustic needs as well as some of the wayfinding at the entry space and the nurse space uh, was addressed. All right, so E1, um, this was E1, Scott Dyer Road was up here. E1, to remind everyone, looked at replacing the middle school, doing um, less work at the elementary. Um, we took the approach on this um, to addressing safety and security with the admin addition and wayfinding and repair work. That's what was done at the elementary in E1, and it replaced the middle school in this location. Um, the next slide is gonna show you E2. You can see the change here is just the amount of renovation and addition at the elementary, again, trying to address the prioritized needs um, in that option. E3, so E3 um, looks at moving um, the middle school. Um, we took, um, there was a couple different building uh, organizational patterns that were explored for the new buildings. One was a courtyard, one was what we call hub and spoke. We've utilized in E3 the hub and spoke, and what I mean by that is you have a hub a collection of spaces. These are all the public spaces. You have cafeteria, gym, uh, uh, the music um, programs, the entry, the library, up front here. 
Um, just so folks know, there is a significant grade change from here to here. So when we come into this level, we are on the second story of these classroom wings, and then it steps down to the lower classrooms, all fully daylit, but there is, there will be, part of that will be um, a, a step down in the grade here. This LWCF field relocates over here. In this option, just like in C minus, the fields that were here um, need to be relocated. Um, and something to consider is you have a playground here that is LWCF looking at maybe relocating that over closer to, to the middle school, that is the middle school play area, and getting it away from Scott Dyer Road. In um, the elementary school, oh, I can see our text, uh, hasn't caught up. It says that the elementary entrance is here, but it's actually here. Um, we'll change that slide. Um, so you enter the building here. You come off Scott Dyer Road. Um, sorry, you enter here. This is the library, for getting everyone familiar. This is the new addition um, that would be the admin entry, right where that kind of glass connector is between the two areas. And on the other side of the library is a STEM addition. Lisa, what is middle school entry next to that um, it's sure. a big gray box to the right, right by the 1930s building? Keep going. Yeah, what is that whole area? This? this? No, keep going. The white. Yeah, what is that? Parking. Okay. So you come in here. Um, you have a bus drop off here. You have parent drop off for elementary here. You have middle school bus here, and then middle school parents over here, yeah. So that middle school entry is, any of the entries are tied to one of these triangles. That's showing that right here is the middle school entrance. Um, and we need to correct this slide. This should actually be pointing right here. So this option does not utilize the 1930s building. So the other two did, this one does not. It leaves it on its own to be turned over probably to the town for something. Um, we kind of just took the approach that it's there, it remains, as we talked about prior. This is E1, E2, and now E3. Does it factor in the cost of closing up the 1934 building in the back? Uh, it, would, it, would, it would have to uh, weather tight the building, yes. Um, but it wouldn't do any of the repairs or anything like that to it. So it seems like we're adding a lot of impervious surfaces. Where, what are we doing with the water to facilitate cleaning water and stuff like that on the mm -hmm. site? Because we're adding, it seems like we're adding a lot of impervious surfaces. I don't surface. think you're adding that much. All of this right here, Patrick, is impervious surface under this area. Okay. And this is right on top of the existing middle school. So we'd have, we, as we move, we have to obviously address all of that, and that will be part of the, the site design um, as we move forward. I need to look to see what they counted for cost-wise, but they did factor in addressing um, any of the runoff. Um, I just can't speak to the specifics on that right now. No, I was just wondering where we are going to put, if we had to do retention ponds or anything mm -hmm. like that, and where that was going to fit on the site. I just wanted to note that this is, I think, the first design we've seen that, like, I actually think that glass corridor is, like, makes me nervous frequently as one of the most vulnerable spots in the entire, like... I've heard that from several people in the building. ...school system, yes, and that, this, I think that is a, a nice addition to put there. Anybody that's not familiar, what um, she's talking about is this connector right here. It's glass on both sides. You pretty much see right through it as you walk across. Um, so the addition of the admin here. And, and there's a door it. Yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, so um, this is the overall site plan. Again, um, we have our main entrance here. This is cafeteria stage between the cafeteria gymnasium. We have our kitchen and services back here. We have um, uh, music and allied arts here, and then um, we have our library and we have our classroom wings out this way. Where do services come into the elementary school? Uh, the services in the elementary school are mostly back here in the, the kitchen area. We do have to relocate 
The boiler room is reconfigured in this because it's actually in the middle school. Um, and so um, we relocate the air handlers in this area, um, but your services are in the back by this kitchen, the existing kitchen. Oh, maybe I didn't understand what the word services meant. I meant like where do deliveries come in? Mm -hmm. Oh, is that the same thing? Okay. Yep. Okay, so this is the existing plan. This is what E1 um, was, or what E1 is. E2 um, really addressed more addition renovation at the elementary. E3, and so it's a little deceiving because lower level um, is the lower level of these classroom wings, but this is set up with the six classrooms plus a world language and a special education. Um, and then we have the team collaboration space here with a workroom for the staff so they have visibility out to the space. We have our one-on-one -on -one in our team space here. Um, and then we have um, uh, some uh, other special education programs and storage. And same layout on all the floors. You'll see sometimes there's a extra, you know, there's a purple, um, an extra purple in this one because there's five world language classrooms altogether. Um, so just a slightly different layout uh, than this side of the classroom wing. The elementary, again, we need to address this. Um, uh, tag is incorrect. The uh, entry is over here. Um, you'll see it as the, the challenging thing with the existing elementary school is just the number of levels, so it's hard to show that as we go up. Um, but on the lower area, um, we're renovating wayfinding spaces. Um, we're renovating the old admin um, to um, uh, become a classroom. Um, and then we have a series of special education small group um, breakout spaces. And then as we look at the existing um, plan, and then again E1 with its limited wayfinding renovation um, and former location of the middle school. Um, E2 took a much more um, grand approach in renovations, larger collaboration spaces in the classroom wings and the small group one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then E3, um, it looks at um, the entrance. So this is an addition here, and this is an addition here. So Orient people, this is Scott Dyer Road. This is the 1930 building. This is the existing library right here. So we add here, and we add here. And this becomes the entrance. This is your admin suite. We get a world language, a small group room, and then a renovated learning commons with a STEM edition, and then renovations for um, the wayfinding uh, spaces um, throughout the school. Where does um, the library go? The library is right here. Oh, it's, it's referred to as the learning commons. Okay, got it. <clears throat> we'll use that sometimes interchangeably. The transition has been learning commons as to the uh, implying there's a lot more ways to um, uh, learn and be able to access information. Um, for those that were on the Wentworth tour, um, this starts to evoke um, a lot of the spaces and programming that that school had. Could you go to the first floor, please? Uh, I just noticed there's no kindergarten addition on this. So what, what happened to those? So what they would remain the same size. Yeah. And we renovated this into a classroom so that there would be, if they needed overflow, there's another classroom here for them to utilize. So we have the six classrooms, and then there's an so additional. That's, that's the six plus one. This is six plus one, and then this is six plus one over here. It's just not part of their, their wing. So Lisa, I have a, a question about- We could add the addition if, if people chose, if that is a desire of, of the elementary right now. Sorry. Um, question about where, where the old entry was, uh -huh. that's still the space where there is the gym uh -huh. and the auditorium, mm -hmm. cafetorium space. Would it- 
that space be able to still have a public entrance mm -hmm. for after that would school be the use and things like that. So yep. there would still be a public entrance over there as well as the main entrance to Correct. the school. Or the it allows you to there. separate it off okay. better too. Okay, thank you. Oh, so this maintains not just the, I, I wasn't really looking at that correctly. It maintains not just the current elementary school gym, but also what the cafetorium is? Correct, because they need to use that as their cafeteria. Oh, okay, yeah, obviously. Yeah. So is there an auditorium? Mm -mm. No auditorium, okay. There's no auditorium in, in the elementary school. In um, the middle school, let me go to that plan. I'll walk you through that. I realize I didn't walk everybody through this. What you have is as you come in, this is your admin, this is your cafeteria, this is a stage, and this is your gym. So similar to Wentworth where they had that stage in between the gym and cafeteria, the approach we took here um, was to have it so you could open it to either side. Um, and we positioned the gym like this so that the bleachers would be on this side opening towards the stage. Um, and then you have your locker rooms, um, maintenance area, and kitchen. So all your services over here, uh, locker rooms um, closer to the athletic areas. You have your admin, you have um, music and art um, and wellness over here. You have your library and STEM. And then you have your classroom wing over here. Um, and you have your common area, um, collaboration area um, uh, for the grade level as well as a vertical connection. Where does, where does this plan leave us for maintenance for the elementary school for like the next six years? Does it take care of all the needs for the next six years? It would take care of the repair items for years zero through six. Okay. And similar question to I asked about B minus and or B plus and C minus. What's the impact on current students and staff with this plan? Yeah, um, with this, um, the nice thing about um, the way that we've gone about, let's say, the addition to the elementary school is it's relatively isolated from where the students will be and where your existing main entrance is. Um, there will be some coordination around those wayfinding areas and whatever happening there. We could probably do a lot of that over the summer. Any of the systems and repairs and things like that, we'd have to look at how to go about that work, whether it could be summer or school break or some areas we may have to um, uh, uh, consider, you know, different uh, uh, overtime or things like that to accommodate that. The additions are easier to accommodate with an occupied renovation on the elementary. The middle school sets itself up really well because you're building the school separate from the existing middle school. So the impact is gonna be traffic on the site, but the students aren't gonna be impacted until um, the building's done and they'll move over and then they'll take the middle school down. So correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which happens occasionally. <laughs> but B plus C minus would require some millions of dollars, and I don't know what it would be. Yep. We're estimating a couple million anyway for that. Right now, space. we're we're where carrying we put, yeah several million. Where do we put students while we're doing all this? Yep. This solution would require far less. Correct. Okay, so we could apply that money to the build itself Correct. rather than where do we store kids while we're renovating? Is that right? That is accurate. Okay, thank you. Questions about E3. Was there, I feel like I should have asked this earlier, was there ever any consideration given to a three-story building or is that impossible? It's, no, it's not impossible. Um, the reason we did two is because the two, there's four grades and they stack better that way and we can be consistent about the, the wings and that allows them to put any grade in any wing at any time. Are there cost efficiencies to a three versus two? Um, <laughs> We wouldn't, I mean, yes, the, you know, uh, taller, less footprint, usually uh, less cost. However, the organization in the building is going to be um, less clear because you, essentially you're going to be dividing a grade. 
um, or gray aids because you're gonna have a full grade plus some on one floor and the same on the second and the same on the third. When we did the elementary school in this model, we had a three-story wing and a two-story wing because the grades worked out that way. Um, so it depends on, on the trade-offs in regards to that. The other trade-off being the, the footprint being small, capturing space back for outdoor space. Um, you, get, you get some, but you're not gonna get a, a a I mean, where it's located, it's taking, it's in between these two fields. It's not like you're really gonna get a field right up against that building there. All right, let's go to four floors. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm fine, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'd have to look into your, um, your Mike, zoning and see if we can do that. That was brought up in the previous yeah. project and there was some neighborhood concern with having a, a, yeah. a big building. And, yeah. and, and part of it, once we go to three, we really have to look at the average grade versus the overall height and there are restrictions for how tall we can go and I think because you're at the center of town there's definitely we'd have to get some sort of waiver to go to that three story um, so um, again I always say it nothing's impossible there's just pros and cons and usually cost and, and trade-offs I, I had a question on that about zoning I also wondered with the taller buildings or how the buildings are structured I know like in one of your prior options, you talked about, you know, if it's taller here, we've got a snow load con yep. configuration. So are you also looking at how, um, you know, wind impacts and snow impacts? Because we have I to. Know, like walking into that elementary middle school now, if it's, you know, winter and the wind is blowing, it is cold in front yeah. of those buildings. There's a lot of wind there. Yeah. So is that something you also consider as your mm -hmm. front east? As you can see right now, this mass right here prote protects you from a lot of that over on, on this side here. And we'll study that further as we refine this. And just because we're showing the middle school this way doesn't mean this is what it's gonna be. Uh, if, if you were to move forward with this, um, this is just showing we've got all the program space in there. Here is what we've heard from the stakeholders, and here is a configuration, an efficient configuration. A double loaded corridor is one of the most efficient layouts that you can do. Um, and um, something that works on your site with your topography. Um, from a massing standpoint, you know, this is gonna be not as high um, if we were to do a two story up on that field because it steps down with the land. Um, so essentially you're just experiencing when you drive up that, that, that one story, the gym volume, if you will, is the tallest volume in the front. Um, something that I didn't mention and some of the other options like C as we're moving the music and everything over, um, we end up having to demo a good portion of the existing building because of all the overbuilds and everything that we're impacting. So when we're doing some of this, like even the cafeteria, kitchen addition, we're imposing snow loads on the existing buildings. We now need to open up that existing ceiling, reinforce the structure, and invest in structure that you're not gonna see because that mass is taller than the buildings next to it. And now the snow drift will, will um, increase the loads on that roof. So just things, that, again, we just have to be considerate of those things as we, as we go through them. Corinne asked uh, some good questions about future planning, yeah. the C minus plan. And I'm thinking about the group that will be sitting here in, in 10, 15, 20 years with Penny trying to figure this out. <laughs> how, I how admire does, your commitment, Penny. How does the E3 plan set us up for future decision making and future site planning and future school building? Yeah. Um, of, of all the options that set you up best, um, because essentially you've invested in one building that's new and that building resets the clock in regards to life expectancy, renewals, all of that. We have minimized the additions to the existing elementary school. Um, and um, that way we have addressed a lot of the needs through this, not all of them, um, but if you needed to replace the elementary school or even make um, different additions, you could continue to add on to this. Um, you, you are not redoing a lot of work if you were to replace it. If you were to add on to it, you're starting to get really tight on your site. Um, but from a replacement standpoint, you've set yourself up nicely 
to spread out the impact of work that is needed on all of your buildings in um, the foreseeable future because right now um, by doing renovations additions we're bringing a good portion of the existing building up to a certain point we still have all the repairs or everything else it's going to be continually doing things to this existing you know amount in the existing buildings new middle school resets the clock you then could replace one I don't know whatever time period you pick um, and you're looking at more of um, uh, repair um, some system replacement in the existing but not replacing both at the same time so this sets you up the best for that um, and it allows you to if you wanted to build let's say a new elementary school even where we're showing the parking lot for your elementary you could build that there and have circulation where the existing school is and again not have to relocate your students uh, Lisa yeah I have some questions and I think they kind of are related to enrollment and, yep. and project what how many students would this I mean I'm looking at one of the biggest things I'm I'm looking at up there is a new middle school size. Mm -hmm. It's 107,000 square feet. Yep. If you break that down by numbers of students, even if we assume we're gonna have 500 kids in there, uh, it's 215 square feet per kid. Mm -hmm. If we have 450, it's 238 square feet. Mm -hmm. When we, we just had a, a conversation with the Department of Education, Mr. Brown, um, I mean, they're, they're somewhere in the 165 to 185 range. Uh, and this is one of the this is one of the places we got a lot of pushback was just the sheer size of mm -hmm. it. Yep. So based on this, how many students could this accommodate? How, how many? I mean, ten years from now, how many kids could be in this school? Um, well, I, I would I would ask you based on the number of classrooms, how when they're fully loaded, how many that would handle? So I'd go back. Uh, we'll have a slide on this in a minute that shows you know just. The, if, you, if you were to load, okay, let's do your, your middle school. You do 20 to 24 for a classroom, right? They do 20 to 24, but right now, we're in, the, in the, this next year, um, we're looking at mostly 16, 17, 18. Um, we have one class size that's 22. Mm -hmm. And most of them are in the, in the, as low as 16, a lot of 17s and a lot of 18s. So we're not really... And our school policy, that's what we're, that's what we want to keep the small class sizes. So that, it's one of the questions that I really have okay. when it comes to sizing for this. And I'm just taking this off of the school's latest meetings on this. Um, next year, the kindergarten, it looks like they're going to be classes of 18 and, and a couple of 19s. First grade is 17 and 18. Second grade is all 18, a couple of 16s. The you third graders are 16 and 17. Yep. Uh, so, or we're building classrooms for 20 to 24, though. So, how many, if we no, have 450 to 500 kids in there, that it looks like is a realistic assumption. How many, how many kids would we be if we're, we're build, building for a much bigger number, is I guess the point. And it's going to be one of the challenges that we'll have in getting something like this approved. So, I guess the question I would ask is would you, a, essentially a classroom for the DOE is 800 square feet and I think even Scott Brown indicated in the meeting that he doesn't see regardless of the number of students in a classroom school districts come back and reduce the square footage from 800 they still see 800 square foot because their thinking is why would you build a for today and not size for essentially what you are saying you want to have in these classrooms, right? Why would you build a smaller classroom? Um, that, that's what we see. We see the 800 square feet. If you, if you want to give me a different number. No, but I'm not, sorry. I'm not saying we, if we were going to do something, we'd obviously build classrooms with 800, but would, would we need this many classrooms if we are projecting we're going to have 500 students? I've used your... Um, there's a slide in a minute that's going to go through all of this. Okay. So I want to hold that okay. until we get there because I think it will be easier to I just to was looking at the number there and I just... Well, I, I want to... But let's do that. Let's yep, hold that. But I want you to think about it differently. I want you to think about it from classrooms. There's six classrooms per grade here. So when we get and we look at the numbers, even for today, how many students... And 
do you want to design to the max number, the minimum number, or the medium, the middle number of that range? And that's what we'll look at because that will start to tell us, you know, whether we need, maybe it's not six, maybe it's five, maybe it's seven, but that's what we all have to get on the same page as to what it is. Otherwise, we're gonna be going around this particular item and, and not get it finite to be able to produce these designs to have everybody on the same page. I just had two quick questions. Uh, the first, uh, another seeming cost savings here is that this plan would significantly reduce our, I thought of a better metaphor, if we were a driver, how much would you charge us for our car insurance? It feels like it would be really high for C in the event that things go wrong. It feels like it would be much lower for, but our, our risk threshold decreases a bit here with finding random, horribly expensive things. Mm. Less sure. replacement, yep, for sure. Less unknowns. With, um, with that, with the middle school portion, you still have those in the elementary, but yeah, less but overall. It seems like we're not touching as much as the elementary, so our risk of encount. Well, you're still doing repair. You're still doing systems. Yeah. So you're still opening things up. Still opening There's still a risk. Th those costs should be factored into the final numbers. Yeah. Re regardless. There's going to be a contingency, but we just need to be ready for their things come up. And then the other question I have, which is, I guess, uh, just maybe just more of a comment or something to keep in mind is that in, and I, you know, we can't solve every single problem, so, but just thinking out loud, the fourth grade wing is still, uh, has this problem of the, what is it, somebody timed it, like six minute walk to the cafeteria or something. Um, is, is there any, way the outdoor space or entrances could facilitate um, a, like a diagonal trek in uh, amenable weather? Like, like if rather than traipsing through the entire school, uh, would there be, I don't know, yeah, like I, I assume that some type of like outdoor design situation where like, yeah, they, they could walk outside from the fourth wing to the cafeteria, which would be uh, a direct line. My I don't know how much my time concern, that, My concern would be safety and security. Safety and security. It's just yeah. thinking out loud. Yeah. Uh, I have two quick thoughts on the question. Um, First of all, I really love that in the new middle school year, collaborative spaces are on the exterior wall rather than like a widened hallway that yep. usually feels kind of dark. And anyway, I think that's really nice. Um, with the elementary school, I think it's probably a net positive where you've put the new addition, the new entry. Um, it's nice that the fourth grade isn't so isolated anymore. I guess it's a bit more central for everything. And like you said, combined with the media center, um, it just creates a nice hub mm -hmm. closer to the center of the school, or the center of the students, at least. Yeah. Um, the one drawback I see is that if students are being dropped off in your entry, your first graders and kindergartners are gonna be the ones going down the stairs and the farthest to their classrooms. Mm -hmm. So that's one drawback, um, but maybe the positives outweigh the negatives, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then my question is about having two separate entries. I, yeah, I guess I would like to hear what you think the positives and the negatives are of having an additional Scott Dyer entry, traffic-wise. Oh, mm -hmm. um, there's pros and cons. <laughs> the nice thing is you will address more of the queuing because you're pulling half of the cars in on one and the other is going to the other. Um, uh, but anytime you, I mean, you already have an inlet in that location, just not as much volume coming through there. Um, so we'd have to study that a little further to understand the, the, the actual traffic impacts, but the same number of students are going back out onto that road just in different locations. I have, are you done? Sorry, you're done. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, I know that here that your company has been hired. I know it's not your studio to do a full facilities 
go over for the city, I believe. Is that true, Matt? Uh, Harriman did do yeah. the, did the uh, town, facilities town in town, structures. yes. And, the, and they're currently wrapping up the school. I would be curious, the 1932's building, what they see might need to be done just to button it up, just to have it sit there as a Hulk. And I'd also like, I think this might have to come from the town council and manager's office, what we plan to do with the building. It's just gonna sit. We already have a building at Thomas Memorial that's been sitting, I believe, for eight years. Is that when we did the renovation? It's either eight or nine. That makes a great training center for our first responders, but that's all it's been used for. And at some point, buildings are like cars. If anyone's ever had a classic car, you don't just park it, you have to drive it, um, or it starts falling apart. And buildings are the exact same way. If you just drain everything and say, oh, we'll get to it at some point, it takes a lot more money to put it back online later. So I guess I'd have to, I'd want to know what the town council wants to do with that building now, not later, because our problem is we're building a site around a building that might be sitting there for 15, 20 years before we do anything with it. And I think that's just not smart use of public money for a building that we don't know what we're gonna use with. So I think that the town council needs to give some guidance to the school department and us of what they plan to use it for. If it's for housing, if heard housing, if I think it'd be a great thing for a, a central office for our, our um, school department, things like that. But they have, we have to get that. And I think we also need to get a number yeah. on what that might cost to renovate to work. I think that uh, before the town council gets involved, the school has to say they're giving it to the town. The school needs to, we need to talk about what we do with that, what we do with that building for schools, if anything. I will say that there are other towns in this state that have had schools that look just like that one, that have wrapped buildings around it renovated it for housing or whatever. Well, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying it yeah. couldn't be reused. I just don't want it to sit like the old children's library where it's just sitting rotting away. I think Matt hears all the time about that old library. <laughs> what, what about the, um, the town employees that are, use, that are working in the middle school? I believe there's five or six maybe uh, um, small not, not large enough for classrooms, but small offices, would, would they be appropriate in a centralized? Are you talking um, about technology? There's yeah, a they're on the town payroll is what I know, not on, on the. I don't know of anyone in, on the town payroll that's in the middle school. Then I'm, then I'm completely mistaken. I was. We have some tech. There, there's districts. Uh, yeah. Say that again. There, there's district positions. Yeah, there's district. Okay, okay. Like, but they so, work for you. Yeah. Yes, okay. Technology. Yeah. Technology. Yeah. Some, some of my main concerns with that 1930s building is once we take down that middle school, its lifelines are cut off. Right. The water comes through the old middle school. Right. The suppression systems come through the old middle school. The fire alarm comes from the old middle school. The heating comes from the old middle school. Yes. So, so as soon as we cut that off, that building is just a hulk. All right. good questions. Very good questions, Patrick. I think it's what we have to determine which Absolutely. option are we going to. Um, and then, that, then we'll decide. I, 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 I think I have an answer what the school department will say, but <laughs> I won't get ahead of the school board. I, just to make a comment about the other entrance on Scott Dyer Road, and it looks like it's lining up with Hill Way. Um, that, I, I think it's worth definitely studying that. I know having lived, living in that neighborhood, Hillway is a cutover from 77 to Scott Dyer and during, particularly during morning and afternoon school times. It's, it's a lot and people, where, where other roads are coming down to that, people are kind of whipping around that curve. But right now, everybody that hits Scott Dyer then turns right. So now you're talking about adding the option to go straight across Scott Dyer and as well, you know, for the people that are coming down. And I, I think there could potentially be a lot of impact to that stretch of Hillway in aligning this entrance mm -hmm. where a regular drop-off entrance. 
There's a crosswalk you know, there too, I think. One thing, yes. Lisa, I think part of your scope of work was a traffic study. Did that show anything on that or? Um, we're not necessarily doing a traffic study at this time for all the different options. Okay. Um, essentially, as we arrive at one, we'd wanna look at that um, and study that uh, that option to figure out how we need to modify that, but I can bring that up with the engineers. Okay, thank you. Other questions about E3? Same, same with the high school. Um, the difference in the high school work here is this, uh, the E series, we'll call it, um, essentially added the um, athletic building out by the fields um, with restrooms, um, and uh, that was the major difference uh, there. Again, um, variety of scope happening at the high school, just need um, clarification on if there are, um, other than the Title IX scope that we've heard, are there other items that, hey, we absolutely have to do as part of this project, or is this area where we can make um, reductions um, in, the, in the project? So these are all the high school scope. All right, so. That, that was five million for the, for, sorry, that was a big number. Seven. What's that? Five million for, for the, that. Uh, yeah, for the Title IX addition. Building up the side. next to the yeah. football field. And the one up front. Yeah. And the one up front. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I was gonna yeah. say, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. And one of the additions is the Title IX addition? No, there's no, um, there's renovations interior that address that. Okay. That's across all options though, the Title IX. That's what we're hearing, so that we should continue to carry okay. that across all options. Yes. And we'll, we'll, we'll three. Get, sorry, Tim. We'll get to this at some point, but depending on the option we take, there is some concept on the school department side that we move some of the high school renovations, upgrades, repairs to our CIP budget. So I, I think that's on the horizon as we come closer to mm -hmm. deciding. When, and, and thinking about what items maybe we want to yeah. kind of push over and maybe make a different That's bucket, if you will. Fair, but there is the advantage of bonding. It depends what it is. Depends what it is. Depends so. what it is. Yeah. All right. Just, Tim, I interrupted you. No, I just, on E3, if you go back to that one, yeah. E3 TBD on all of that, so that doesn't include any of the, the repairs? Well, right now, it, we're just putting TBD. I mean, we're not carrying, we don't have costs for any of these options right now. We're, we're saying TBD because I think that's a collective conversation we all need to have as to what are those priorities. We, we think um, you may wanna look at carrying the repair items or we need to know are they in the CIP and we should take them out of this project. So that's to the idea of, of kind of moving some of that stuff um, or what, what could, what portion of that could be, or is repair in the project and it's the renovation additions that look at the CIP. And I should clarify, I was looking at por a portion of this, not the, not the whole not, thing. Not what the is our thing. average CIP budget right again? Right now we're just, we have half a million dollars in oh, CIP. that's it. So, so if I, there's a way to boost that sum and address some of this, um, at least immediacy. Yeah. Yeah. Dave's, Dave, Dave Bagdasarian's team was even talking about this just on Tuesday night, that the CIP has been kind of chronically underfunded for, for lots of reasons, um, but that once we have a decision on where we're going, um, right-sizing that into the school budget and also uh, trying to, there's like a formula that he, he said, we probably underfunded the CIP by like, I think, what was it, $7 million or something in the last? It's been five. underfunded for decades probably. But, but to use this whole uh, process as a way to right size the CIP allocations and then right size the, uh, how, we're, how we're putting it in the budget and then also how we're spending it. So I think he has been reluctant to right size it until we know well, what we're doing. Yeah, the LED right, lighting is a good example. I mean, you, you, you know, do you do it, do you not do it? You know, ultimately, it's beautiful. We've now got it completely done. I think Chuck helped get, get, it, get it pushed over the, the goal line. But uh, it's one of those things that, you know, 
we're not going to be in brand new schools or renovated schools for four more years. It's probably paid for itself anyway. So those kind of renovations that we don't necessarily have to wait mm -hmm. a couple of years to do, uh, that's why I'm kind of anxious to see the CIP list and, and see a little more detail of what all that is that you've uh, analyzed for us. Mm -hmm. uh, all the, uh, the original list is in the original report we did, but that is getting constantly refined from that. Um, so that is, that is available. But um, we do break down a lot of the repair for the high school later on. Um, but right now we've put TBD. We didn't want to assume anything um, and wanted to have the conversation. Um, if collectively we think repair wants to be carried in the high school for all these options, then we would carry repair for elementary, middle, high school for all the options and, and have that kind of across all those so we have that, that number carried. And then maybe it's the approach of the CIP funding some of these renovation, renovation additions or, or other funding mechanisms, um, revolving renovation funds, you know, those types of things. Yes, I was, I was going to mention the revolving renovation fund because that also came up at the budget workshop that Caitlin was talking about. And um, I think they're probably also discussing some of that in the school board buildings and grounds committee meetings. So, Tim, that's probably worth, you know, the, the most recent one I'm sure is online to view. But um, I think they're, it, it's not necessarily just the school CIP budget where these numbers would hit, it could be identifying items that could potentially, as Lisa said, other funding through the school revolving renovation fund, um, which does give, um, you know, for, for certain types of um, repairs, it provides funding. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Here we go. We're through the options. We're on to enrollment. Um, so enrollment memo. Say one more thing. Yeah, absolutely. Options. At what point, you know, when we, when we present this to the town... Can you speak in the mic? I'm having a hard time. Sure, I'm sorry. When we present this to the town, we won't have the B, B plus, C, C minus, and all these. Will it just be A, B, and C? Or I guess I would look to, to you guys as to what you think would be clearest. I just think it's, a lot of people are going to get confused. We're, we know all about it, but the mm -hmm. person that's coming home from work every night, they're not going to know what yep. C2, C3... And on, I get confused on yeah, it myself. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm with you. It does get uh, confusing. Tonight we included it so you could see the difference from one to the next. Right. Um, but if, if in the, in definitely something we can start talking about now in the forum, how do we want to present this information to the public so that it's clear and the messaging is coming across as to what we need? A, B, C, or now. one, two, three. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. A, a, B, go ahead. One, two, three. One, yeah. Used a, B, C already. There you go. There yeah. you go. One, two, okay. three. Okay. We're going to stay with our uh, numbering for now, but in the, uh, in the forum, we can change it to one, two, three, or whatever you would like us to do. <laughs> Just give them names. I'm going right, to use let's, hieroglyphics. Let's dive into enrollment so we can hopefully <laughs> settle this. All right. Enrollment memo and approach. Real, real quick. Can, okay. Thank you, CBS, for coming. Tonight, please come to our forum if you if you can on April fourth. That'd be really good. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. All right, enrollment memo and approach. Okay, so there's been a lot of conversations around enrollment. Uh, there was a memo that was shared with us. I think Chris, you forwarded it to us. Nasdaq forwarded it, or sent it to you, talking about um, the um, enrollment projections. Do you want to kind of frame what this memo is about? Yes, yeah, certainly. That um, We work with NESDEC, uh, as do hundreds of school districts around New England, to uh, give enrollment forecasts. Uh, it's part of a yearly thing to help us with budgeting. Um, it also helps, obviously, with school construction projects. Um, we had a, an enrollment forecast from October 2023. Um, they gave around 3.1%. Enrollment, uh, it predicts out to 10 years, um, a th around a 3%, 3.1% increase. Uh, that was updated about a month later after NESDEC got some updated birth rate information from the state. Um, they shifted that number uh, to around 8.1% or so for 10-year growth. Um, there was some more work done uh, to get some provisional birth data for 2023. 20, uh, um, 
that caused us to go back to NESDEC uh, and try to get some more information from them. Um, they've given this memo, uh, which gives uh, kind of a, some guidance on how to do some enrollment forecasting, but they, uh, this is as much, uh, Larry and I talked with them last week together, um, Larry Benoit um, from this committee, uh, to get some further insight, where are they at, what more can they give us. Basically, this memo uh, is the most they can give us at this point, uh, based on the provisional birth data. Um, we won't get an actual enrollment forecast from them based on birth rates till the fall again. Um, so, in turn, they said, uh, basically, what does Harriman have to say as your architect? Um, what do you all say locally? It's a local decision. Um, it was pointed out that 2022 was 76 or 78 births. That was a high, high mark. Uh, the provisional uh, data for 2023 is in the 40s, so that's a low mark. And where the perhaps the forecast, the original forecast from October 2023 uh, was around 58 births, which is kind of the mean, the median. Um, so basically, that leaves us as where do we go? We've been talking about this for a long time, right? And it is important because it impacts the design. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious, I think we all are where Harriman's at based on this. Um, and then we have to decide where do we go? What does it mean in terms of number of classrooms, building design? Mm -hmm. um, I'm comfortable as superintendent because I work with NESDEC. They've worked through the school department, um, kind of returning back to that 3% projected growth uh, with some contingency. I think we have to have some contingency in this um, because populations change, migration patterns change, housing stock turns over and birth rates change. Mm -hmm. But I think probably moving back from that 8% makes sense. Um, at least from, the, from my perspective as superintendent, I know others on SBEC have other opinions, but yeah. that's kind of where we're at. Good. Other comments before I go to the next slide? All right, so this is, I've been the thorn in everybody's side on enrollment. And I agree with a lot with what Dr. Record's saying. If you look at what they're talking about there, and they couldn't give us a full blown one, but that little box there basically t says, we're gonna have a minus 1% to a plus 3%. And- That's what this uh, box says right here. Those, if you calculate those numbers, and I, I don't necessarily understand how they're getting there, because. After that 42 birth in 2023, they're using 42 to 48 moving forward, which that doesn't make any sense to me because their formula calls for the last five year An years, average. Last five year average. And, and so to move forward with 42 to 48, they really use those numbers. We'd be in probably the 1300s. But they're saying that we're gonna have 534 to 558. And in K my, my, the other th critical piece I think we need to the other thing I think NESDAQ uses is our real numbers. And our real numbers, if you, I mean, from what, what the district leadership team has presented for the fall enrollment is 1,456 kids, okay? They're, you've gotta go down to their projection on this based on what their formula and our enrollment numbers, the, you've gotta go down to the year 2027 to 2028 before you get back above those numbers. The, the school enrollment right now, they're projecting we're going forward at 1481, we're already gonna be at 1456. So we're already substantially below where they're projecting. So I would be comfortable if we, if we came in, and, and I'd really like to hear what your planning process would be if we were saying, instead of planning for 1626 kids in 10 years, if you were planning for 1500 kids in 10 years, how would all those things about extra classrooms and agile classrooms, if you, if you could do your work moving forward with 1,500 kids, which is probably still a stretch from where we are um, gonna be based on our real numbers. They, they've even said that the, only, the three, next three or four years are the only ones that are really reliable. Mm -hmm. Well, four years out, they're saying, they're saying we're gonna be at 1,472. We're already at 1,456. So I don't wanna, beat this point to death, but I do want, if we end up with a, with a, with a certain amount of money, we, we as, a, as a group can unanimously approve what we can throw at this project and get the most out of it. 
I want to use as much money as we can, and if it doesn't really make sense to build new classrooms and we have more money to do other things with it, I'd much rather do that. And the, the worst thing I want to have is 10 years out with us having six to eight classrooms that we don't have, you know, if we are in the low 1400s. And the next, the other, the other critical thing that you got to look at is the next two classrooms that graduate beyond this big one that's going out, high school's dropping by 41 kids next year. The, the junior class is in the 120s. The sophomore class is in the 120s. So we very easily, and if we bring in 105 to 100, we're going to have further reductions, we know, based on our real numbers over the next couple of years. So we could very easily be two years from now at 1,425 kids. So, and then if you look 10 years out from there, um, I think you could very easily see that the a real number would be 1,500. And if you had to work with 1,500, would your process be a lot different? Would the challenges that you have be, a, the, the solutions be a lot different than, and so I, I guess as a compromise, instead of going with three, with a 3% factor, uh, I, would, I would like to maybe talk about if, if we went forward with something less than that, but I really do think we need to take a good, strong look at what our real numbers are uh, when we're planning on this. So I didn't mean to no. belabor that no, point too much. I think, though, like, just to throw it out there, like, NASDAQ is refusing to give us the full report because it's preliminary numbers. The woman on the phone said that we don't have an apples-to-apples -apples comparison on on NESDIC, like they didn't provide us what their, what their, like we, we don't have an apples to apples comparison about the numbers that NESDIC had in February every year for the last 10 years compared to what they ended up being in November. We, the, the woman was uncomfortable saying that that was going to be an accurate number. So uncomfortable that we got this, in my opinion. I think she was reticent to say that this number was for sure. And and we're using this number, but it is it is not an apples to apples. We, we don't know what this number is going to be in November. And she said that it changes. And I, I also, I don't know, I feel like philosophically, Believing in the town means believing that families are going to keep wanting to come here and raise their children. And saying, oh, it's decreasing anyway, we just need to build a smaller school, is in, is in some ways saying that we don't believe in, in CAPE. We don't believe people are going to come move here. We don't believe people are going to have kids here. I think having, I mean, if, I think going by the exact possible m margins to get the, the smallest square footage we can based off of the next 10 years doesn't believe in the future of the town. Can I? I, I think that uh, we might want to go back to the higher level question because we're going to get buried in the numbers again. Let's go, because um, Tim asked the question, what is the impact if we model based on, you said 1,500, correct? Um, so what is the impact? Are, are we talking like uh, two classrooms? Are we talking like X hundred square feet? Is it really that significant a difference based on um, 1,500 versus 16, whatever, or? Divided what across what the, number did you model based on? Well, I, I, I'm, I've purposely not answered that question because I'm going to show you the next slide if we're ready to go there. Okay, so what we did is we looked at, and again, the memo does not break it down grade by grade for us. Your enrollment study does. So we were forced to take an average per grade. Um, so your enrollment memo only gave us grades K through 4. It gave us today, today we know the number, 540, and I say today, I believe this is your October 1 enrollment date. This is what is used across all school districts. Um, and the enrollment memo showed an average at year 2033 to 34 of 558 grades K through eight. So 
that shows 108 to 112 um, uh, going forward um, per grade. And then your enrollment study that was done in November at November 6, 23, essentially shows 540 and then 590. And clearly there's a difference between these two numbers. Um, we've, we show the enrollment study for 1106 down here, which is the five through eight, which you have 44, 444 to 520. What we look at or looked at here is, okay, we're given a class size range and they vary. And this is per your school board memo. 14 to 18, 16 to 14 to 18 kindergarten. First and second grade, 16 to 20. Third and fourth, 19 to 23. If I were to just use the numbers that are in their memo, and if, and if we want to adjust plus or minus, you know, for grade level, we, if that's what folks would like to do, we can. But we took that information, we can only have K through four, and we looked at the low to high and how many classrooms we would need to service those students based on your class size range. And at the low, if we were to do the low end, which is the 14, 16, 19, we'd need six to eight, depending on the grade. At the mid, and this is for today's numbers, at the mid, we would need six to seven, and at the high, we would need five to seven. If you plan a classroom to your high end, you have no flexibility moving forward to absorb any growth with staying within those range. We typically recommend to school districts to aim in the middle. This way, you have flexibility to kind of ebb and flow in those classrooms. If we weren't even to pay attention to the November study and just look at today's numbers, in K through four, they're telling us I need six to seven classrooms in grades K through four. Now, I don't have the information based on the memo for the other grades. I, we have down here showing the enrollment study for November that it's six, and if it needs to be five, then it needs to be five. We can look at the previous study to pull that out. But I would, I would challenge folks to think about the classrooms, because that's something that we can't easily modify later. So how many student, how many classrooms do we need to service even today's kids? And that gave us sort of, okay, we need this many classrooms, and the plus one we're talking about isn't an extra empty classroom, it is a special education or world language class in that wing that is sized the same as a classroom. And all it does is allow them the flexibility to move those programs around in the school. And so then, if we were to take the mid-range and say, okay, we're gonna do six plus one at the elementary and six plus two, because we have all those world language classrooms at the middle school, and we take the six and we take the middle number of the class size and we multiply that by the six, that gives us our student population and then I can accurately size the cafeteria, the other spaces that are driven by square footage. But your special education, your art, your music, all those things don't change. All those things do not change based on your enrollment. You need to figure out how many classrooms you need to serve your population, and if you're gonna to design to today, then that's that number. If you want to add a little bit of fluctuation to that, we can add a percentage, but by going in the middle, we kind of build that into that number, and then we take that number and we apply it to those other spaces that are driven by square footage. But a lot of these programs don't change. Special education needs still there. We went through that. That's why we spent so much time digging into that because we need to get that right. We need to understand what that is. And we even are talking about building in the flexibility to where you may not have um, FLS, which is a high need special education need in some of the schools today, but you could have a student that comes tomorrow and needs that. So how do we then take something like a special education resource room and make sure that there's a kitchen built into it so that you have the life skills in that room to be able to flex with that? So that's kind of what we're looking at. We're trying not to add classrooms. We're trying to right size this for the classrooms you even need today. So that, that's, our, that's been our approach. It's less about exactly what that number is. I, I would like you, I would, 
request that you think about it from a classroom standpoint and how many classrooms you need to serve these kids. And then from there, we can back into a number that we agree upon and I can size the other spaces based on that. Um, that's been our approach. It doesn't really, you can see it doesn't really change from the memo to the enrollment study. We can go back and look at the earlier um, enrollment um, study and see the impact to that. Um, but that's been our approach and that's, it doesn't, to answer your question, not exactly, it doesn't have a big impact depending if we reduce, you know, 100 students here or there. Because you've got to think about that's across 13 grades. So we only have, as soon as we trip above a certain number, we need another classroom. So that, that's how we plan schools. So there ha we, we don't have a crystal ball, but you don't want to have it to where when we open the school, we don't have enough classrooms for these students. So if we want to plan for today's number, because there's no confidence in any growth, then we just need to know that. We typically would take what's in the enrollment study and add 3%. Could I, I just want to make a few comments. Uh, this is Larry Benoit. Um, I uh, concur largely with what Tim, you know, uh, professed, at least in terms of how to approach this. Uh, it's a difficult situation that we have new information. It is provisional, and I'll acknowledge that, and that we uh, should hopefully have um, release of the final data within the next month or so, I, I'm hoping, from the main CDC, Dr. Wilcox, who provided the information to us, indicated that based on historical experience, at this point in the um, reporting cycle, there would be only a handful of additional births reported to the main CDC, and that would be statewide. But at the same time, it is provisional, and we're getting probably the best that we can get from NESDEC. They really are the only uh, I think reasonably trustworthy source for this type of data. And so we have to sort of work off of it and modify it um, to meet the needs of this project. But I think a key goal of ours has been on the finance committee is to reduce as much as possible through cost effective design and planning the impact on taxpayers. And we need to get the size right in order to get those costs down and assure that we are building right size, that we uh, will be able to reduce the cost of each of these three proposals and, and, and improve their chances of getting voter approval. And that's why I think it's pretty important that we try to settle on a reasonable number here. But we should get some additional update on the uh, uh, birth rate. We're, we're dealing with the impact of the pandemic. We have two huge outline real numbers, 74, um, births in uh, 2022, which was much uh, higher than the average, and then it appears down to only 42 in 2023 as a rebound effect. And But the mean, as uh, Dr. Record pointed out, has been averaging around 58 to 59 births pretty steadily over the last uh, decade or so. And I do want to point out that we've been in a downtrend, with the exception of this blip, um, in COVID for over 10 years. So it's, it's not a question of people moving into Cape Elizabeth. It's a question of family sizing and family planning. And so we, we're seeing this, it's a national trend and, and the uh, declining birth rate is now resumed post pandemic uh, across the country. I'm not necessarily saying that's gonna to apply to Cape Elizabeth, but higher income families tend to have fewer children. So this is an important issue. I think we need to try to come to some agreement um, and I did want to ask you a question, Lisa, about your um, uh, clarification on your calculations on that first upper left-hand table where you've got the uh, 21524 enrollment um, memo. You've got um, the 2033 to 34 average at 558, but the the memo itself says that um, over those years it's 534 to 558. So. That's, that 558 is not an average, that's the high end of the range that I believe you're showing there, is that correct? Yeah, I didn't say that was an average number. I took the, aver I took the average grade number of that total. So it is the high end of that. So if we wanna pick a different number in between there, we can. Um, well, 
Well, the, the actual average between those two projected in that range, 534, 558 is, is 546. I, yeah, but to clarify, I did not say 558 was the average. I said at the grade level number, so 112 is the average grade level for K through 4 for the 558 number. Right. Okay. Well, I, that's why I wanted clarification because it says AVG with the number for that year. So that's why I assumed it was an average or, or, or it was apparently it's not. It's the high end of that range. And, it, and if it were an average, all I'm saying is it'd be about 546 and the class size would be 109. Now I realize these are not really large differences, but they are significant compared to the, to the most recent and previous projection, which was showing 8.3% increase, whereas presently with this modified projection, it's either <coughs> negative 1% to plus three. That's a big difference. And I mm -hmm. think we have to come to grips with it. That's all I'm saying. Yep. I'm not not arguing either either way. I think collectively the SBAC needs to come to an agreement as to what it is because we can't move forward with our design process without this data. This is the first thing that's resolved in a state funded project so that we can correctly size the building. Um, it's a little different with any of the ad reno because the space we have is the space we have. I think your biggest change with any of those numbers you put out there could be the number of classrooms needed in the middle school. But I would recommend that you come to an agreement on an average size per grade that you are designing these solutions to, and then we can move forward with that. Um, I think your numbers are bang on, personally, and I will tell you why. You're talking between our high and low 24 kids. That's nothing, really, if you take it over all the classes. it's. It's a minuscule number. It's not even really, I don't even think you really even need to consider it as part of the data, my personal opinion. I can tell you working in schools, being an AHJ in school, there is no such thing as an empty classroom in a school. Trust me, if you give teachers extra space, they will do something great with it. So don't think that there's just going to be rooms that just sit there empty because that is not ever going to be the case. You can't it will exponentially cost us if we have to add more space onto a school. And I'm sure any design that, that the architects are gonna come up with is gonna have expansion capabilities because that's just the way we design schools nowadays. But today's money is always cheaper than tomorrow's money. Adding on, who knows what the building codes will change, things like that. There's so many factors that if we size these correctly and to the higher end, of what we need in the long run it will save the town money it just will it's just pure simple economics we have to pay for it now but in the long run it's going to actually save us a lot of money i believe so i think that your numbers are are spot on i like the three percent i would say to keep that um i think the high the if we were talking a hundred kids or 200 kids that would be a totally different story either up or down but we're talking between our high and low point here, 24 kids spread over 13 grades. At what if we are talking 100 or 200 kids a couple of years from now? And, the, and I'll say, look, it's been an unprecedented time in the wake of COVID where you had you know, uh, crazy changes in terms of, of birth rates. Um, we've now settled back to the long-term trend, but there's three houses for sale under a million dollars in Cape Elizabeth. There used to be 30 to 50 at any given at any given time. It's not that people don't want to move here. It's that no one wants to sell in this interest rate environment. Is that being factored in to, the, to these? Um, you know, I know that birth, we've been talking about birth rates, but are we talking about in-migration possibilities? So I say, what if this trend continues where literally no one could move here because there's nothing for sale? And we have empty classrooms. I'd rather have empty classrooms than, be, than have kids that have, have classes of 20, 25 kids. I'd, and I'd did. rather have an option E that might cost $5 million less that gets us an extra 2% of the vote or whatever it is that we can be successful. So we I can't just- I don't think you're gonna find that much savings. That's, in the, that's in my that, question for that, Lisa, is, is this even the most cost-effective place, to, the most effective place to pursue cost reductions? 
Um, the square footage is. I mean, the, that, the may, way to make the biggest impact in reductions is, in cost is square footage. So the lower your square foot, I mean, it's a, it's a direct equation, square foot times cost and gives you your total project. Um, I, I wanna, I, I, I hear everybody and I, I understand we, it's the hardest thing to dial in in a project. You never want to design for less than you need because then you're adding on. But you also have to honor all the taxpayers in the community and not have more than you need. And it's a delicate balance. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's gonna happen. But even if, what, I mean, essentially what we've planned for, just take the elementary school, for example. We've planned six classrooms. That's what you need today in the mid-range. Well, but we really don't. I mean, we got, we've, what we have now is the flexibility to have classrooms with, with, with 16 kids in them. But if you no, just we, take five, we don't, we don't so, have that now. But if we but had, my, if we, my, and I don't I'm, know, Tim, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you this, plain and simple. My kid, when he came to kindergarten, could barely speak, all right? He took speech pathology in a damn closet. That's not right. It isn't right. So why you have to re right size these buildings? And well, we aren't going to do it just by not adding them. That, I'm, that's happening. I'm just oh. trying to get objections out of the way. I've been in marketing my whole life, and I want to get objections that I'm going to be getting faced with as we try to get this project approved. And if we continue to work on building classroom sizes for 24, up to 24 kids, and we have 16 to 17 or 18 in them now, and people are saying, well, why, and why don't you take instead of that 16 class size and make five of them and have 20 kids in a class, it's still the bottom of your range, voila, you have a classroom that's available. If you've got two levels that have 18 in them, why don't you have five classrooms with 22? We have two more classrooms available, so we have three classrooms. How do, we, how do you help me to, to explain that when I'm trying to help this thing get approved in the town? And, and those are the kinds of things we're going to get pushback at. We've got to push so, back on the size of it when we tried yeah. to do it the last time. And it's similar kind of objections, Patrick, we're going to get yeah. this time. So it's just something I want to try to right size this so yeah. we can all go unanimously forward and get this project approved in November. Tim, I want to make... These are communities, it, though. That's the problem. The, each, yeah. each grade is a... Let's make yeah. sure as we continue this conversation that we hear from everybody. And let's lower the tone a little bit. We're in this together. This has been an issue for years. We got this. Can, can I just ask one question? I know Cindy was going to say something. Yeah, and I just want to follow up when you're done. I have, well, one more comment, um, and this is to Tim and Larry, and I think there's been a great focus on birth rates. But from our meeting with NASDAQ, um, there are four considerations in the calculation. Birth rates are one. The second is student migration, meaning people moving to town. Number three is the stability of grades as students progress through the grades. And then building permits issued. Building permits issued in our town have been flat for 20 years. The town council this year has set a goal, I believe, to increase housing in this town by 10% over 10 years. That's going to bring in more families. The goal is to bring in more families in town and more students are going to move in. So, you know, a portion of your calculation that no one has even acknowledged in any of this is new builds. And, and we're having more of them. And, and also from the um, research, the data that was provided during the housing diversity study, the initial uh, Camowin report was showing that our towns, um, as, as houses, it, it would appear that um, the median age is actually getting in lower in town and is, is in, in family sizes are, are larger. And that's be, that was the trend as of 2022, which indicates that as, as our seniors are aging out of their homes, perhaps those homes are turning over to families with children. So I don't think, I, I, I agree there's a pandemic blip, but another part of the pandemic effect is people moving out of urban areas to rural areas, and that's what we're seeing all over southern Maine. And uh, you know, our, our limited housing stock has isolated that us from a, us from a, a little bit, 
but with the new goal of 10% housing development over 10 years, I think we're going to see more people in Cape Elizabeth. And that's important to consider. That would be wonderful. But we don't know that yet. There's a lot of unknowns. And there's no perfect answer, I think, is so what let, Lisa's trying let to Let Lisa go, and then I have something I want to. Yeah, so I guess y y there is a comment made that we don't need six classrooms. If you're, right now you have 540 kids in K through 4. If I just divide that by the number of grades equally, not using the you know existing per student number, so you have 540 in K through 4. Is that, is that accurate on what you have? I'm sorry? Do you have 540 students today in K through 4 yes. in your data? Okay. So if I just divide that by the grades, we're at 108 on average. When we design schools, we, we try to keep the same number of classrooms per grade or per, for each grade, so that we're creating, to Patrick's point, that those communities, they're teaching in a first grade, a second grade, a third grade. If I just take the 108 and I use the middle number, whether that's what you have exactly today or not, if you use the middle number, I'm not even adding a contingency to this. It's just, in some ways, the middle number does that. So if I use 16 in K and I use 18 in one and I use 18 in two, 21 and three and 21 and four, I'm being told in this orange column right here, I need seven first grades and six, or sorry, seven kindergartens and six one through four. We've essentially planned this with six K through four with the idea of the flexibility to move different programs to different classroom wings without disrupting, keeping all those grade level classrooms together. So if we were to reduce the number in one grade and increase it in another, you're now going to have your second grade, the majority of them one area, and the other two second grader classrooms maybe with the kindergarten or vice versa. So it depends on, you know, essentially the approach if you want to take it. The, the way to accommodate keeping those grade levels together is to find sort of that, call it a sweet spot, right? We need more in K, but we're going to adapt. We're going to do six, 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 six there. We can look at the, the middle school number, whatever number we end up using. If it's, you know, the, the 444 today, um, is it six or is it five? Does that reduce? We can play with that number too. I don't think you're going to see a big difference in the elementary number based from low to high because you either need five, five, six, six, seven. So really it's all of them need six, six up one needs five, just based on fully loading those classrooms. Um, so I guess I would ask, are we trying to make this plan flexible or, and provide the number of spaces in the configuration to support the teachers as to what we've heard in creating these classroom neighborhoods? Or is it we're trying to drill down the enrollment to the lowest number possible? Because I would argue 108 versus 109, there's not a big difference. And I'm not saying that we need three, seven, you know, three classes of seven and two of six. We've planned it for six. We're not, it's not extravagant. So if if we want additional flexibility, or if you want to if you want to drill down more and have less classrooms and then plan for additions. It's easier to add on a classroom than it is to increase the size of a cafeteria or any space that you need to plan to have those students gather. So it's harder to expand the size of the cafeteria or expand the size of the library or things like that. It's easier to add on to the end of a classroom wing with additional classrooms in the future and that's typically where we would plan for future expansion. So for example, the, the cafeteria that you planned for us, the two new cafeterias in the new kitchen, how many students have you planned for each of those? I'd have to go back and look, but we can, we can drill them down once we arrive at whatever the, the number is. Yeah, okay. Could I just ask, you know, we, we hired an expert in addition to Harriman to guide us. And I'd really like to hear from you, Chuck. Um, you've done this work in countless school districts. You've probably heard this conversation with different characters. I'm gonna use the mic. But I think it'd be really helpful to get your advice because we've got a, 
we've got to have some compromise here um, and move this forward. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, but I will defer. I will t tell you this is the expert. Honestly. You both are. I'm just saying that. You both are. I can give you an anecdotal experience, not from somebody that creates this number of classrooms or comes up with the, the big figures that establish this. But I've yet to see a school in 30 years of building schools across the United States designed to the lowest number of classrooms they need today and not come back 10 years later and say, we missed it, we should have added more classrooms. I've yet to see anybody that has built seven schools, seven classrooms or six classrooms per, per, per grade and come back and say, we should have built it for five. They've never done that because I understand what Michael says and when he says, we don't know what's gonna happen to our, um, our enrollment. We don't know what's gonna happen to the growth in your town. You're 100% right. But if we look at the communities that we work in, in Massachusetts, for instance, I'll give that. Yes, statewide enrollment has gone down, but population and students in schools goes up. It creeps up every year. It creeps up because of what your town council is doing. It's creeping up in Massachusetts because we have a similar thing called 440B housing, which is providing affordable housing for, for towns. Your legislature is talking about trying to create more affordable housing across Maine. Add affordable housing to your town, and if you do for five classrooms, four years from now, five years from now, you're going to need seven classrooms. So you have to watch what your projected growth is going to be going forward. And that's what we, on our side, always recommend. Five classrooms is an odd number. It just is. Six classrooms, an even number, balances a building. It just balances it. I won't say do it because it balances and it makes a building look nicer. I'm saying because it balances and helps you project for where you might be. You'll never go down. I'm just telling you, it does not happen. I live in a community, I've said this before, very similar to yours. It's a wealth factor community, et cetera, et cetera. Your, your property values, they never go down. People want to move into your town. They just do. People want to move into the towns that we have, like ours, like yours in Massachusetts. But if people move into your towns, they're not my age. They're bringing two and three kids. It's just the way it works. At my age, I'm seeing people flip their houses, and Michael's right. I would love to flip my house now and move out of my house. It's bigger than I need. We won't do it, though, because of interest rates. We won't do it because there's no place to go. But watch it settle down, and then you'll see families move into your town that are two and three kids. You're going to wish you did six classrooms. You're going to wish you did seven classrooms, but you can't. It doesn't make sense. I would not. I've not ever seen a school district go against what NASDAQ has said. You talk about NASDAQ, and I understand there are people that don't, I won't say don't trust, but maybe don't re re recognize. This is all they do. They're the only game in town when it comes to this in Massachusetts, and they've been questioned. The state board in Massachusetts does their own, the state school board, they do, they do their own calcs. NASDAQ checks those, ca those counts for them. They're never wrong. They, they just aren't. I don't know how they know, but they just aren't wrong. We rely on them a great deal all the way across Massachusetts. I know they use them in New Hampshire. It's just what they do. You talk about having experts, they're an expert. I stand by their numbers, I really do. I've looked at them, I've compared them to other projects that are going on right now and projections and everything else. Not at anybody's requested me to do it. I've done it on my own because I knew you were going to have this conversation. I would tell you to rely on their numbers and rely on what Lisa's telling you. It's just, it's, it's if you build five, you're going to wish you built six. I'm telling you right now. You will. So that's my sort of background and experience. Thank you. Lisa, can you speak to what you were just talking about prior to? It's more expensive if we undersized 
um, cafeteria. In like an option E, is there a flexibility? Obviously, you don't want to add on, but if you had to, say we, mm -hmm. say. We can look at that. Say there was a Scarborough Downs of Cape Elizabeth coming here or something like that, and all of a sudden we're gonna have, you know, 20% growth, 10% mm -hmm. growth. Can you add on to the ends? Is that what you were saying? You're talking about the classroom? The classroom yep. specifically. We, can, we typically will plan to add on to the end of that and set it up to where you can add classrooms okay. to the end of those wings. Um, so the, the harder, that, that's easier construction-wise to add on easier. to. The compromise shouldn't be around the larger Community shared spaces. Okay. Um, I'll use Wentworth as an example. When that was designed, they used a projected number to increase the cafeteria and the gym and those spaces and the library, knowing that the additions they were planning for, you know, a couple classrooms on the end, they needed to be able to still house those students in those spaces. They're just harder because they're, they're a larger space and it's not like you're just gonna bump the wall out four feet and be able to you know, accommodate them or 10 or whatever. Um, so that, that's what we typically see is that those are where you build in the contingency hmm. and then you set up your classrooms to have a consistent number per grade but un be able to be flexible to maybe you need seven this year, five this and we can swing world language or special ed or those things that aren't as inter, you know, aren't as related as the grade level. Um. Could I, I wanna just say, and this is going back to a, a Tim point, et cetera. Number one, I think where I came down rather relative to the enrollment is I didn't understand a, a statistical company uh, using an anomaly to create a trend, and the anomaly being a, a blip in birth. So why wouldn't we try to either uh, pull that, reduce that in some way to what the norm, uh, more normal trend would be? And I think that's what I, I think that's what Larry was is, was trying to. Um, to say and try to stress is mm -hmm. that let's look at what our our trends have been relative to um, uh, people uh, moving to Cape Elizabeth is also a trend in Cape Elizabeth that people stay once they come here and their kids leave school and yes any new people who move in may have children or may not because the price of the houses tend to be in a price range that people who are headed toward empty nesting may uh, purchase so i just want to figure out and i understand what you're saying lisa it's like you know less design the greatest amount of flexibility from a classroom perspective and what teachers and the school is able to do from, um, uh, from that perspective. So with all that said, what is the number we can settle in on? Um, is, it, is it 546? Is it 540? Is it 5? Uh, 48. Um, Chris had the uh, suggestion, do we come with a median of 54 because of the anomaly and... Uh, 58, 59. Yeah. Returning uh, to the NASDAQ forecast from October 2023. What do you mean by 58, 59? That was their number of births they were... Oh, you're talking about births, okay. Yeah, at that time, but I, going back to that report before the updated report, mm -hmm. November 2023. Which is how many greater than what you might have seen a previous year? It's, uh, it's hard to compare to previous year because we were in the middle of COVID, so. Well, before that, I'm sorry. I'd have to go back and look. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and look, but they're adjusting to new information. So in 2023, based on number of births, Housing starts, in migration, other factors they calculate, they were a 3.1% increase. Yeah. I, I think. I could make a 
comment the, on this, they, Kenny? They, Larry, just a quick sec. Yeah. They do, I mean, the, rep, the, project, the report they gave us, they gave us years of birth going back to, to 2008. And the interesting thing when you really look at this, and, 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 and I don't, I'm not a real data person, but uh, the number of births and the number of kindergarten kids that come from those births, there's no correlation between them. You look at t uh, 2008, we had 73 births. There was 96 kids in the, neck, in the kindergarten class. 74 births, 101. Uh, 47 births, 80. 54 births, 100. We, we clearly have a lot of in-migration, mm -hmm. but there's really no statistical correlation that you can find between the number of births and how many kids actually come into the, into the kindergarten class. Because it varies based on how many of the hussies move up here from New York with four kids, you know, or maybe somebody moves into a house, they have no kids. But the, uh, from going forward from 2018, it was 50, 58, 19, 63, 20. To, point, to Chris's point, it's probably in the average in the mid-55s. So, so, but it always ends up somewhere around 100 to 105. So, so that can I 124 make a kids we had a couple years ago was a real, that was a real uh, abnormality. Yeah. So. I'd, I'd like to make a suggestion. We listen to our experts. We listen to Chuck. We listen to Lisa. Um, and we've talked with NASDAQ. I think, you know, the original, it sounds like the original October NASDAQ report did not contain the anomaly from November. Um, and I think, you know, the committee just needs to put it to bed. So I would suggest, um, you know, let's vote. I think, Chris, you were suggesting the October 23 numbers or numbers that were comfortable. Lisa, those were numbers that were comfortable, the original uh, NASDAQ numbers? I suggested numbers? that when we started this conversation was the 3% was some contingency um, because no matter what, we are in this moment in time, we can't count on it being static. And, right. and we need to provide so, whoever is leading this district, leading these schools, teaching in these schools in the years ahead, some flexibility to meet the needs of okay. students so, and enrollment changes. So, Okay, so I'd like to suggest that we have a vote to use the October 23 NASDAQ numbers and apply leases recognize practices for contingency that seem appropriate, and the committee will vote, we'll have a decision um, of, of how to move forward with this. Because I don't think everybody's gonna be on the same page, so I just think we have to decide what makes sense and make a vote. I think I could vote if I could see them. Oh, Larry didn't get a chance, I cut him off. Hey, Larry, I'm looking up again. Go ahead, Larry. Larry. Thank you, Penny. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, I think we should follow Chuck's advice. What he told us, and what I said earlier, is we only have one real expert resource here, and that's NASDAQ. What NASDAQ has told us in this updated um, enrollment projection is negative 1% change to plus 3. That's the range that we're in. And that's the latest. Now, it's true that we had a trend line in the October uh, projection at about three. But this is actually showing, you know, potentially a decline from that. But I, I'll say a caveat. We, we should probably go back in a month and look and see if the final data is ready. I, I would feel comfortable doing that. But I know we have to make a decision on this, but... If Chuck's advice is right, he says NASDAQ's never wrong, then I'm willing to follow it, and we need just to find a number there within that range that we can agree on. I, I have some reservations about slapping 3% on top of it. Um, I don't think that's necessary, and I don't think that um, we um, need to do it at this level of change, it, but it's a big difference between 11.3% and 3% uh, or 6%. And, and, and as uh, Lisa said, the real cost is in square footage. We're talking about $700 a square foot. If you can knock off 5,000 square feet, that's $3.5 million. So anyway, that's my uh, thought for what it's worth. 
my, my only question is, and to that very last point Larry made, is what, what are we talking about, not in terms of number of students, but in terms of potential square footage that we could maybe, maybe right. delay? Maybe, you know, we build 10 years from now because, you know, population's growing again. What's the, yeah, how much square footage and what's the dollars and cents behind all this discussion? That's what's lacking. Lisa's raising her hand. Lisa's raising her hand. Anyway, can I ask, I feel like my question is related to what you're about to answer, just, to, just because I've been a little confused hearing what Tim said, so just before you answer, you've, you've talked a lot about our class size and how we could just make them more kids in the class. Are the Department of Education's classroom size standards larger because their classroom capacity standards are higher than Cape Elizabeth? So are you designing classrooms to the standards they have for a larger class size? They don't have standards for class size. Okay. I thought they, they were 800 They have numbers that they use feet. internally, but they do not, there is no published standard for that. There is a square footage per classroom, and that's 800 square feet for elementary, okay. and 900 for science, and 1,000 for pre-K or kindergarten, um, and different specialty programs. You know, special ed sometimes has different sizes depending on the need. Can um, I restate my point? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. You can restate just, your point. Just, I think I'm going to bring it full circle, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain you will. Um, across the three options, if we're looking at using the October report versus the November report, what is you know, the price difference for option mm -hmm. one, two, three? And, and that's, I think, what, what really matters. In my mind, it's what matters. And I don't care what project, you know, if, if it's, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars difference, then this is a long drawn out. But if it's millions of dollars, then it mm -hmm. matters. And especially if we feel, uh, you know, the next generation or, you know, five, ten years from now, they're in a position to right size it without uh, an enormous burden, that would make me feel better. Just to clarify, I don't, I haven't heard anyone advocate using the 11 percent number today I think we've moved. no but the original projections yeah. were based off of that so I'm curious what's the but difference no. you shared tonight yeah. isn't based off of that right the, the three so, all right that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so the if I just use what you have today yes you would need six classrooms based on 108 per average per grade and I'm just picking that and that's six classrooms what I would recommend is we take the October enrollment and we outline the same thing as to what the low, middle, high is for classrooms. And we did that a while back. We'll pull that back up. And then we can look at, well, if we add 3%, what does that do to that number? Does that trigger an extra classroom? Does it not? Does that, in how many... How much bigger does that make the cafeteria? The cafeteria is really the bigger one. The gym doesn't change much. A court is a court size. You're either going to divide it with a curtain, have two gym classes, or you're going to have one. It's either going to be elementary, middle, or high school size. It's not driven by population unless you need additional space for PE. It really comes down to your library and your cafeteria. Those are the ones that really get driven by square footage. So if we took your October 23 the original enrollment study that we were provided before it was updated in November, forget November's enrollment study is what I'm hearing. We take the October one, we look at that. We look at the memo and we look at today's number and we're gonna look at the total number and we're gonna, we need to arrive at a average number per grade that we are designing the building to. And understanding we will look for creative ways like we have been doing to provide flexibility. We will look at today's number, and then I think, Larry, you had thrown out an average between the low and the high, um, and we can look at that as well. Um, and then we can look at if we were to add 3% to that, what would it do? And we can show you all that data, and it will either show us, it will show us how many classrooms, and it will show us how big the cafeteria 
and the library need to be, and we'll be able to see those deltas. I think that will give people the data everyone's looking for to say, okay, we agree with this number of classrooms for this number of students, knowing that that number could be this low or this high, and we need to plan for a cafeteria or a library of this size. A lot of the other stuff, and you guys, special education is driving square footage up in schools everywhere. I know that the state has different square footages that they use for middle school. South Portland's at 196. That's the latest DOE funded middle school to be built. It's at 196 per student. We can't talk about not being able to predict. We cannot predict the need of special education. We have no idea how many kids are going to come in with a different need. There's no enrollment study for that. So we have to build in flexibility and we can't short change, short change the programs you have today and yet build in flexibility in other spaces for those. We can't trim there. We can only write, we can only get the number of classrooms right and then right size these other spaces and then plan for potential growth in the classrooms. And if you wanna plan for a certain number of classrooms, do you, you then need to make the decision, do you use that number to size your library cafeteria? but we'll provide you guys that data because I think that will help you guys arrive collectively at a number that we can use going forward. Sounds great. Okay. To me anyway. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. What? In order for me to keep, okay. In order for your team to keep on going, we have to, we have to work towards the six. The six right now. We yeah. have to. In order for her to keep on going and meet your schedule, she has to keep working along the lines that you're going to have for classrooms. Because if you're going to tell her it's going to be less. So what he, I'll just <laughs> recap what he's saying. In order for us to meet our schedule, we have to keep moving along with the six classrooms. To wait for different direction, we're adding, we need to add weeks to the schedule in order to absorb that because it's going to change our designs. So we can continue in this path knowing we will figure out that number and then right size whatever square footage we have to or classroom count we have to and report what that is. But for us to keep going, we need to keep moving on this, knowing that we will provide the data and we'll collectively agree as to what that number is. Okay. Lisa, if you would correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're looking at B, C, or E, I don't know how you could come to any other conclusion but the number six. Because if you're looking at anything with the middle school, you, six dominates all of your grids as far as what your classroom needs are going to be. And then in the lower grades, it's either six or it's seven. Uh, perhaps five in a very rare anomaly uh, in the outer years, three and four. So, and I don't know how you can deviate from that much at all. It comes down to probably the bulk space, as you say, like the, your 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 mm -hmm. cafeterias and your gymnasiums is where, if you're going to find it, it's in your adjunct spaces, but your classroom spaces. It seems like you're pretty much locked into that. I just wanted to note for the for the record for the public that 15 the per your comments on special education, that I think it's 15 percent of students in Cape Elizabeth receive some type of special education uh, support at this point. Currently. Currently, we're seeing those even numbers if, rise if you, everywhere. If you look at our current classroom makeup, I think we've got, on average, we have six now, don't we, Chris? So, I mean, that's what we have now. Six, so, sometimes that, we have yeah. Seven. And, I know, and looking at projecting for next year, we've got one that's seven, the rest are six, and then the fourth grade next year is projected to be five. So, mm -hmm. I think if we got, if you plan for six, I think yeah. you'd be right on on track. So, yeah. I'm there too. Okay, so we'll keep that with the class. I think, I think we then, and that's why I was saying let's focus on the classrooms and we'll back our way into I the like number. That better. I'm comfortable with, if we plan for six, I think that's the smart thing. Yeah. The data tells it, you say it, Chuck says it, <laughs> Tim Thompson said it, and <laughs> I said it. And I just feel like at some point we have to put it to bed. So we're planning for well, six. I mean, so do we have to? We're, we're planning for six and then we will show you the six, what that means in regards to total number yes. for elementary and middle school, okay. and then what that means for that. Because you're gonna get a number 
and if we load it at the low end or the high end, they're different numbers. And so we just need to know what the total population is we're planning those other spaces for. We, okay. we did discover, and it's late for all of us, we did discover when we visited South Portland, though, that they, uh, they felt their cafeteria was too small. Yeah, I think so we I think all experienced that, research, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And, yeah. What are, just, can I just say, chairs, what do we have left to accomplish? I think we've... Lisa's got, I can just go through this really quickly. You'll have this data, um, but it was requested. So high school scope, here's the breakdown on one slide for all the options, um, B, C, E1, E2 as they were. Um, and then we put in the six to 10 there so you could just see what those other costs were. On the next slide, we then looked at renovation in addition for B, C, E1, and E2, and we gave you rough order of magnitude costs for whether it be cafeteria improvements, classroom acoustics, so on and so forth. So you have that data. And then the special education programming and prioritize, this is a summary of what we took away from a really great conversation. We've had many conversations with SPED. It's one of the hardest things to dial in because Every district calls all the programs different names and they have different needs and we just, we have to get it right. So we left, four of us were on this call, we left this feeling very confident that we understand the program and how to program it in the buildings and that's what we're, we're working through the plans right now. So this is a summary of uh, what was shared with us. And Lisa, as you, that's also a summary of why these schools are challenging to fit all of our needs into them. Yeah. Because many of these things are new programs. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and so um, we've documented, you know, all these different, not, and not all of these are full-size spaces. So it's, you know, the resource behavioral, those are full-size. Um, OTPT is a full-size. Others are smaller spaces with one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one, so we have that understanding. RTI was the hardest thing for us to really wrap our heads around, but it's essentially a, a, a group of, um, uh, what's RTI stand for? Interventionist? Response to intervention. Response to intervention. And so what we've done in the designs and the options that we can, we've put them as a touchdown place where that is their home within the building, but then there is a breakout space in each of the classroom neighborhoods um, where we can fit it so they can then push into that neighborhood. It's actually a much more efficient use of space. Um, and then prioritize programming for elementary. Um, we heard continuously separate elementary and middle school cafeterias address safety and security. Flexible small group spaces and classroom rings for RTI SPED and when they aren't using them, they can use them for collaboration. Learning commons and adjacent STEM space, similar to the Wentworth, and then address the H HVAC. So we task them with, tell us like the top five things, if we could only address that in addition to repairs, what would they be? And this was the list, so that helped us dial in on especially E um, when we're looking at the elementary school. Um, and then mechanical systems, I'm not gonna go through all this, but it shows you we started to break down the repair. This will show you what we mean when we say repair in each of these options. Keep in mind as we go through them, like from B plus to, or let's say B to C, you'll see in the lines all match, they're all the same scope, that some of the scope falls off. It's because that area was renovated and that system was included in the renovation. Um, but this will give you um, essentially what is part of the zero to three the three to six, and again, this is just mechanical. Um, and then six beyond is not included in the repair number, but you can just, we put this in here so you can see what are those other items that would be coming up in the future. Um, and then this is the high school, so that was elementary middle school prior, three to six, and then um, continued, and then uh, this is what uh, I think Marcy's reviewing this right now, and David does. They, the, Marcy and David have the full spreadsheet, and this is, we organize this per option. This, the other spreadsheet is quite lengthy. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's one way to describe it. But this, again, this is just mechanical, um, but this provides you an understanding, because I know a lot of people are trying to wrap their heads around what does that mean. Um, 
And then um, mechanical base design, we were asked to provide information, um, and these are new to the deck from the one you got. Um, this is uh, highlighting the potential efficiency uh, main incentives. Understanding right now their program goes from um, uh, 4 1 to 6 30. So you, it's, that's what that window is. They typically renew programs, but we don't know exactly what they will be. So it's based on the current information. The base design only does cooling at the library, admin, summer programs. Um, and so for new construction and renovation, you can see that when we provide the VRF air cooled heat pump um, in the new construction and in areas of um, uh, renovation, you can see what the potential incentives are um, for the options. Um, and then we broke it down for the middle school. Again, this is not full building cooling. This is just those areas that I articulated. Um, I promised my mechanical engineer that I would put this note at the bottom because he put it everywhere. Facilities that heat with natural gas are not eligible for VRF incentives. <laughs> so just to be clear, um, <clears throat> then on full building cooling, you can see um, we're replacing a lot more of the systems with the VRF. Um, we're replacing all of them in order to provide the full building cooling with the VRF system. VRF aligns you with an electrification approach as well. Um, so we, we put that in there for each one of these options. You can see the new construction versus renovation potential incentives. Um, and then you can see it for the new construction. And then you can see it for the high school with full building uh, cooling. Um, and it should be noted that the incentive cannot exceed 80% of the project cost, um, but I don't necessarily think that that's um, gonna be a factor with the, the numbers we have. All right, schedule and next steps. We would love to meet next week because we have a lot to update you on. Um, so if uh, that's really why we put this slide on here, we know there's been a bunch of changes. I think you guys have reviewed those already. Um, but our team is um, in the trenches right now trying to get all this information pulled together for you guys. So we want to continue to get feedback. Um, please continue to send um, the co-chairs any questions you have. Um, that helps guide us and um, what information we put in these presentations. Um, so that's it. Uh, Lisa, I just had one question. Yeah. Uh, when we met back in December with your engineering team, uh, we discussed getting a a uh, total amount of kilowatt hours of yeah. uh, power to heat the middle school and to heat the... Um, yeah, I can get that too, Larry. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. And Richard Parker and I will then follow up with, with your, your team and uh, take it to the next step. Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely. Any other questions? I know we've had a robust conversation and lots of great... Uh, insights. You All right. Cookie, Lisa. <laughs> I think I need some water first. Um, I'll save it for Lisa. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Lisa. That Thank was Lisa. fabulous. I'm looking forward to next. You're good. You're good. I'm looking forward to next Thursday when we can spend as much time together. It's, uh, uh, okay. With that, let's. Uh, because I gotta go have supper at some point in time. Um, we want to do a communications update, and we can um, get into the survey thing and we vote on that. Uh, yes, we are. Um, we met this morning, uh, subcommittee, uh, communications subcommittee. A um, few things we're working on. One is a courier ad or insert, probably more likely to be an ad at this point, um, not in the upcoming courier, but probably in the next one where we will outline the need. However, uh, I think what we uh, saw tonight was really helpful, seeing you know, the fact that we have three options out there. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the needs, you know, in, in community forum and, and you know, on the on the website, but how are we thinking about solving those needs? So we, we'll we'll, um, we'll we're gonna try to we're gonna connect on Monday in a you know, 
as a, as, as a group and, and work towards, you know, we're going to have a full page, a lot of room to work with. Um, it's always good and it's always important to remind the town why we're doing what we're doing. And, uh, you know, ultimately our goal is to solve for these needs um, and ultimately to be successful. So, um, anyway, I think I've said enough about that. The next item that we are starting to work on, which is super important as well, is um, developing um, a strategy to work with local groups to, you know, in a, in a more intimate setting than, than our larger public forum for early April to present um, the final three options with the level of detail that we expect to have at, you know, come April 4th. Um, and then the third item, um, sorry, the last thing I'll say about that, that will also serve as a foundation for further outreach and engagement with, with these groups throughout the remainder of the summer going into uh, November of, uh, you know, for, the, uh, for the referendum. Uh, and, and last but not least, um, we discussed, um, we discussed a, a follow-up survey. Um, sounded like a fun meeting, that one I missed last week. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we um, we discussed uh, you know people's thoughts on on conducting a second survey, what the you know challenges might be, or you know what the concerns might be. Um, we agreed that we should vote as a full committee on whether we should move forward. We received uh, a proposal from Portland Research Group for for that second survey, um, which would go to every single household. Um, it would include um, detailed information about the three options. It would include, in my mind, detailed information about the needs, similar to the content that we're creating and distributing already. Um, but it would also allow us to have a, repre a proper representative sample of everyone in the town in terms of um, what options do they prefer, given the cost, what tax increase are they comfortable with, um, and it would, we would also capture, similar to the last uh, survey, um, you know, how did they vote previously and, and basic demographic information so that we can absolutely ensure that we have a, a proper representative, representative sample of uh, the people, of everyone's opinion uh, across these three options. Um, can I ask? We can talk about that. We can debate that further if anyone's comfortable. But um, can I ask yeah. clarification around the survey? Because I think another mm -hmm. thing that we talked about, is, and I'm assuming that there will be a subgroup that helps work with Bruce or whoever to develop the content of that survey. Mm -hmm. I think we kind of all, or several of us, came to an agreement on its purpose in life. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to make sure that uh, people understand that it's not being developed in a vacuum. It's being developed as a team. No, that said, I still I think this is a far simpler survey than yep. the last one. The last one, we had a lot of learning to do. We were coming off of the, the previous referendum, and we needed to understand, meet people where they were at that moment in time. There's a lot that's changed since then, um, including the property revaluation, um, which is obviously going to affect some people's opinions, maybe for the positive, maybe for the negative. We have to understand that. We have to understand that a lot of, you know, significant number of people are upset that option G is now off the table. Is that going to have an impact on our ability to get one of these or all of these options over the table? Um, we've done a much better job, no offense to the prior committee, but we've communicated along the way throughout, you know, a lot of different means. We've been in consistently in the Cape Courier. Um, the website has been consistently updated at least over the last few months and you know, my personal hope as a member of this, of this group that we've been able to move the needle in terms of transparency, in terms of people's comfort by having you know, a transparent level of cost associated with these three options as well. And now that people understand the need or our hope is when they, you know, before they go to vote, they, everyone should understand the need and by putting this survey and all this information in every mailbox you know, as Corinne, I think, said, you know, people will do their homework. Um, my hope is that we will be able to have a significant positive impact over where we were in November 2022. So, but if we don't do a survey, 
then we're, you know, in my mind, we're working in a vacuum, and we the only real representative data we have to work on is, is the last survey, and I just think so much has changed since then. It would be such a shame, in my opinion, uh, to not do a survey uh, and get the best possible data. Nothing's perfect. There's no perfect number in terms of enrollment. Nothing's perfect, but we need the best data possible. We put so much time and money into this effort that I just think it would be a, a shame not to uh, take this last step. I like one of the statements you said in uh, the communication meeting, which was it, it will help us test how effective we were from We've a been. communications yeah. perspective. Yeah. I think that was really good. Any questions for Michael around the survey? Let, let me yeah. add logistically what would happen next if we move forward is I will, I've asked uh, Bruce, st stay on standby, but I would like him to come and present to the subcommittee next Thursday with mm -hmm. a potential early draft of that of that survey because we don't have a lot of time either. We have to, we probably have two weeks from this point to finalize things. Not the final graphics and everything that will go as an insert, but in terms of locking in what we're what we're asking and what we're what we're hoping to get out of. So he's not doing any work till we say go, but I want him to come prepared next Thursday to, to get moving, so. As a rough draft. So. Yeah, there's no final draft, but yeah. Wicked rough draft. I don't have a question, but I guess I would like to kind of give voice to some of the, the concerns before we, if we're gonna vote, before we vote. Um, I, I think it's essential to have a, a, a feedback mechanism, and if it's the survey, I think, I agree, we need to test how effective we've been, we need to test the waters, I'm 100% in agreement on that. I think my concerns that arose with the survey were tied to how um, our last meeting, we, I don't think we did a good enough job, as Cindy kind of alluded, did not allude to, said in the beginning of this meeting that we didn't do a good enough job um, acknowledging the feedback we got via the Google form, and I think we we caused bad feelings in the community about it, and I think we ended up doing, we ended up making a choice that was, that was not in line with the feedback we got, and I think that also contributed to the bad feelings, and I'm, I, I'm deeply concerned with the survey having a straight question on it that, that allows people to, to have a pseudo vote, because I, I feel like if we allow you know, not everybody is like Al here sitting with us in the trenches hour after hour through all of these meetings. And I, I, I'm, I'm deeply concerned that if we put something out there as a survey that allows people to make a, a just a, if, if at any point they're allowed to just make a straight choice between the three, that that is going to be seen as a pseudo vote. And if we don't follow through with that, we will have lost the support of the community. And so I guess to clarify, I'm not, I'm not against the survey, but I am kind of against that being a question on it. What's the, what are you against asking? One of the questions being which one would you support, A, B, or C? There's no point to doing a survey if we don't ask that. That's the whole point, I, unfortunately. I, but unfortunately or unfortunately. But people are gonna make a vote in November. It's going to happen. We don't have a, that's right, what we're, that's but what we, we're doing. but we undermine the purpose of this committee is to sit here for seven hundred hours over the course of a year, and learn as much as we can and make an educated decision based off of everything we hear, based off of everything we hear from Lisa, everything we hear from Chuck, everything we hear from the public. We're making an extremely informed choice. But if we don't ask that question, we're not informed about the public's opinion. I, go ahead. Well, I think you can ask questions about options without saying pick one. Yes, and we'll I honestly don't understand. We, we need to talk about this next week because I don't understand so, the direction you're trying to take this in, honestly. It doesn't um, make any sense to me, personally. I just, I'd like to have Bruce it's, in Portland It's not that I don't understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying, and I, that's why I raised, that's why I questioned whether we should do a survey at all, because I do think people are gonna wonder where that question is if it's not there. But I also think, think that if we put it there and people vote, they will feel like they voted. And if we don't go forward with what they chose, I, I don't know how, 
I think that we'll have, I think that we'll fail. But what if, what if 47% of, I'm making this up, but just hypothetical to your point. What if 47% would support option E? That doesn't mean, I mean, that would, that would, I would assume we would all be very encouraged by that, right? But what if 70% say no to option E, right? I have no idea. I sit here as agnostic to the three options. My, my first goal and goal since day one, since I joined this committee, was to support an option that will pass. And we need to ask the question. We're not, we shouldn't be afraid of what the people think. We've done what we can. We could always do better, but we are, not only that, we're putting this in every mailbox. This is an opportunity for us to communicate three really interesting options, each with their own cost and benefits. At some point, people are gonna participate, and I want them to participate with full information, and I want them to know how we got from where we were in November 2022 to the final option that we're presenting, and we need to take it seriously. This is a relatively inexpensive way to make sure we're on the same page. And it doesn't mean we ultimately have to select the one that gets the most votes, because it's not a vote, it's an opinion at this point in time. But we need to know it, and we need to take it seriously. So I just want to make, raise the questions I raised this morning, um, because I think this, is, we need, this needs to be considered in whatever survey we send out. What is different, we need to know what is different with what the public knows now about the project than what they knew in September. We have a lot of good data from September about what people know about the last project. How do we gauge what they've learned? And so that goes back to what Michael said. This is an opportunity to test how effective they've been. But we need to make sure, because if they don't understand the problem, how can they choose a solution and choose an option if they don't fully understand the problem? So I'm not opposed to the survey I do almost think there's an opportunity to somehow get an understanding of, you know, with the survey, use the survey to educate, get an understanding of the, help them get an understanding of the problem or gauge what they understand about the problem. And then us using all of our information that we have and, and from Lisa and from our experts, are, you know, we would select an option and then the time to test that option, and this also goes along to the school bond election uh, data book that I had. Um, once there's an option, then you test the water if that option could be supported. But in, in some ways, I feel like doing a survey to ask the public to choose three options is asking the public to do the work of our committee, and, and I think we've got to, first of all, make sure the public understands the need and the issue and the options, what our potential solutions are. But I think a one-shot deal to do all of that is, um, may not be, may, may not end up as we'd hoped. And it is not at all that I fear the data at all. I just want to make sure that people are understanding the problem and how the solutions address the problem. Otherwise, if you just go out there with three things and a price tag, I, said, I, I don't feel like the problem <laughs> is that schools are expensive. I mean, that's an unfortunate truth, it's a fact, but that's not the problem that we're solving. And I fear if you go out without too much background information, it can be perceived that way. Well, we're also gonna, at the same time, we've got plans with the communication committee to do flyer, I mean, we're gonna do ads, we're gonna do inserts, so we're gonna be, along the way, we're gonna be educating them, to Cindy's point, on what the needs are, what the potential solutions are, so I think we are going to be, this survey's not gonna go out there in a vacuum, it's gonna go out there along with a lot of good information that we're gonna be using the courier for and inserts for, so I think it's critical that we do do that at the same time we're, and. It, you know, we are going to all have the opportunity to, Caitlin, you're going to have the opportunity, Mike's going to have the, we're going to have the opportunity, I can't imagine putting this survey together without your input, but, you know, we're going to all have an opportunity to, to help uh, design this survey. Absolutely, but, but 
um, this is this is um, you know this is not just about collecting the opinions. It's about educating at the same time. I'm going to suggest something. Um, it sounds like inviting Bruce to the next communications meeting is a good idea. Um, it will give us a chance to ask him good clarifying questions, give us a chance to discuss this when it's not 1030 after a long week and a long Thursday. And we could probably choose to vote on this next Thursday. I would request to vote tonight because we don't have time. We don't have time, just like we... I don't understand the difference for Bruce since he's already preliminary thinking about it. He's not. He's not being asked to think about it until he knows that it's going to... Oh, I thought you said he was thinking about he was, it. He was... The idea was working on the assumption that we approve this now. I mean, seriously, are we not going to move forward? Is there any concern? Is there a majority against moving forward well, with, with a survey? Can I, there, can there's... I, can there's I, can I say something? Go ahead. Well, I just want to finish what I was saying. I, I think it's important for this group to feel they've had a chance to process this and talk about it and get to yes. And talking with Bruce. May Who's at no? I'm surprised there was anyone at no. To be honest, I, I had no idea until I came back from San Francisco last week that there oh, were. We're hearing there it there now. Knows. I'm, I'm trying to make sure we yeah. we can work through this and not have a divide. That's the divide I mean. come. We we work together on the survey, right? Yeah, but I, but I, or or are we not having a survey? That's what I want to know. I'm not saying no to it. I'm just looking at process. Penny, sorry. I think uh, the uh, the contention, the rub, is going to be uh, agreeing to the objective and the uh, content of the tool. And so Bruce is going to be there. He's going to hear what we have to say. But I think. Everybody needs a voice in what what are we trying to achieve through I think we did an excellent survey. job with Bruce in the first go around. I have full faith in Bruce to do Oh, I didn't say I didn't. So That's not what I'm saying. But, I'm saying that when we are in a communication meeting mm -hmm. next Thursday, it's a conversation of what is our objective? What are we trying to get at? And um, and because we can get to a understanding of what options people may be in favor of. Mm -hmm. And I bet Bruce can guide us in this process, asking at different types of questions versus direct. And I think that's a conversation we have to have. I'm not opposed to the survey. I just say we need to decide what, how we want that tool designed. And I think just to just to clarify, because I think you you kind of alluded to it, and I, I'm not afraid of the data. I think it's very valuable to have the data. What I'm afraid of is asking somebody what they want for dinner, and then having them answer me, and then giving them something different. If I could know what their bandwidth was for what they wanted to eat ahead of time, like I. If, if they could just, if I could poll them and say, what kind of food do you like? And then get that information in a, my, my fear is asking somebody a question, having them take the time to give me an answer and then saying, oh yeah, never mind, Because that is a terrible dynamic. And, but I'm not, I want to know what they think. I, I desperately that. want to know what they think. I don't understand that analogy in the current situation though. We have a public forum. That we're, yeah. in, that we're having on April 4th. I think a survey to educate, where the questions kind of prompt people, like, I don't think I can answer this question until I go, like, that's look at one of the Harriman flyers or something. That's great, but a survey designed to educate is not necessarily the same thing as, as a poll. Then what is it? survey designed to educate. I don't know what that means. I mean, means, I work in market research. So <laughs> I think... I, I don't know what you're well, talking about. I, Corinne, you actually had some good examples in communications this morning about how to educate with the survey, I think, or some of the... Talking about kind of like homework or something. Was that your input? And I'm sorry to... <laughs> I think I had said something like, um, for example, like when a teacher gives a pop quiz to kind of gauge how much the class has 
you know, taken in of the knowledge. So that was the analogy I think I'd used this morning, but yeah. Yeah, almost using it as a tool, like mm -hmm. not like a scavenger hunt, but asking questions to ensure that people are digging into the right information and knowing how to weigh the different options. Yeah. Can we, like Lisa and Chuck, do you guys, like are my fears unfounded? I, I am perfectly like willing to be told that. Like have you guys had situations where communities go out here and take what's kind of a straw man and then that, that, that's my fear. And if you can tell me that fear is unfounded, I will, I will listen to you. We, if you go out for a straw poll, I can speak to that. You're going forward with what they support. That's been our experience. Right, right, but why wouldn't we go forward with what they support? I'm not saying, okay, do they, I think, I, I'm not gonna answer that question, that's up to you guys. That's what um, I don't understand. What if I think you need to, we, we I, don't, might I don't think we want to ask the question. We don't want to hear an answer we don't like. No, it's no, not. That's not what we're I want to know. I want to know what people need to learn yes. to make an informed decision. Yes. I don't need to know right now what option they need or what option they think they want, because they might they might change their mind. I want to know: Are you aware of these things? Are you aware that the way classes are taught as different. Are you aware these are the problems of the schools? Because that tells us that's what we need to communicate out so people can make better informed decisions down the line. I don't want, because I don't want to have people vote on a referendum in a couple weeks on a thing, because that's what they're going to, they're going to shove it in our face and say, well, that's what we told you to do. We don't know the outcome of this. Per we don't. I, I know. I don't. I don't know the. Why are we assuming that? I'm not assuming anything. Yeah, I don't assume but anything. But but I think it's too early in the process to ask the question because I don't know. I want to know how much more education we, we need to give the public. We don't have a choice. We have to make that choice in, in early in early May. But I would rather that. know. I would rather us make the choice we think is right and learn what the gap is. What and learn what we need to do to the public to educate them to agree with us, then have them make a decision that we're not sure is fully informed, and then be. We need to know what that it. gap is. We need to know literally know what that gap is. Definitely. And you're not going to get that by dancing around. We need to know of those three. What are you know? Rank them, or you know, tell us tell us your preferences. It's not complicated. I don't think we should be afraid of asking that question and we should not be afraid of the answer. We should embrace it and hopefully, hopefully we can get our best option, our most expensive option close. Chuck, get back there. You don't get to come up and then close. walk back to and your chair. So that I we feel comfortable as a committee that we could close the gap if there's a gap and maybe there's not a gap. Maybe, maybe, you know, people, we don't know. There's so much, there's so much difference versus where we were when we last summer, and certainly a big difference where we were in November 2022. We're not gonna divine, the purpose of a, of a poll is to, to get clean data. Why did we, add, you know. But it's not a poll, it's a survey. If we were doing some poll where, where we weren't gonna present some elaborate set of survey results to the community that we, this, here's this very set in stone product that tells us exactly what you think, we were just doing a, like a like a poll where like I don't know like, however they do polls that I would feel more comfortable with that that would just be data that we could use and figure out how much we need to move the needle I mean we're talking about like p people take these feedback opportunities extremely seriously that's what we've learned from the first survey and the Google feedback form which is good. so are we are we considering moving forward making a decision on the three options without a survey is that what we're is that what i'm hearing that we're no. hearing no as a committee we no we, i think we is, have vast that's different not, that is not what's being said i think the conversation is about how the tool is constructed and what questions and how uh questions are presented and um and I think that at the communications meeting, we can, we can talk about that. But I don't think, and when Michael says you, people are afraid of the answer, I'm not afraid of the answer. I just want to 
uh, make sure we aren't creating unrealistic expectations. Now, if we form, and we'll be working with Bruce and company, potentially, and if what, the way the question is posed, and we can all talk about this, is, uh, is you frame it that this is, uh, this is just to understand and not to uh, uh, create our 100% direction. You can word it in some way, but I think everybody has to be open to listening to each other. And we aren't disagreeing, we're just saying we might approach it differently. And I think if we're going to have somebody in the room that will help us design the tool, then he may offer something that says, this might help you get there. Um, so I just think at our communication meeting, we need to talk about how we want this tool constructed and be open-minded with hearing each other's thoughts and ideas. Okay. Uh, and we might settle on we're going to ask about the three options. Uh, could we make a yeah. vote? Could we make a vote tonight to go ahead and move forward with doing a survey, and had, then I begin have, the process of having the meetings to do what you're we talking have to about? Have this I out have in no. Mail. I have, time is tight. April one. We need to be done with this. I understand that, and I have no problem with doing that, Tim, as long as we are the people who are on the communications committee have an understanding that our voice is going to be heard. I agree. So I'm going to make a motion that we move forward tonight with a decision to move, to move forward with Portland uh, Research Group uh, with a survey. Uh, and as part of that motion, I would, I would say that the Communications Committee and as many people on this committee that want to participate that and that can work with us and work with uh, the Portland Re uh, Research Group to put that survey together. I'll second that, but Matthew wants to say something. Just a logistical question. Uh, last time, because you know we started out at 19.5 and it was 39,000 by the time we were. That will not happen. That. I'm just wondering, what's the like? I'm looking at the proposal. proposal that's all. Was 20. I'm that's one thing we need to. Do. That's the other whole side of this coin. Is that I don't want to wait another week because we technically should have him under contract next week if he's engaging us. This is his work, right. and we need to do that. So my plan is was, hopefully is to speak with him tomorrow at some point, and um, and uh, prepare can, for next Thursday. Yeah, and you can share the conversation we had. Yeah. We On another logistical note, do we have the same rules as town council? What time did we did we start discussing this in time to take a, is that like a thing? Oh, you're, you're that, fine. We're fine? Okay. Fine. You're fine. Yeah, on that side of it, there's not a, there's not a problem. I wasn't there. sure. I didn't want it to have be a null and void vote because we started gonna, talking about it after 10.09. 1,600 results. Well, that, that's, a, that's just my, that's, yes. well, just thinking from a budgetary contingency standpoint, like I noticed that he was at 750 plus or minus 10 percent, more or less. And yeah, I will. I be just want to know if there's if it's there's great. if there's brackets it's on great. the other end of it. That's We're all. fixing it, roughly fixing it, okay. closely <laughs> pegging it, loosely pegging it. But we're not going to uh, process 16. We don't need. You know, the, we're going to. Sounds like we'll have some you know questions, uh, maybe that I wasn't anticipating, which could be a good thing, but. This is not going to be a six or seven page survey or whatever it was. There's last no time. open ended questions. It can all be scanned. It can all be stamped and it's going to be yeah, that's a process. So, just for, we have a motion, we have a second. Yeah. Let's make sure we have discussion. So, anyone that wants to say something, we want to make sure everyone that wants to say something has a chance to say something. Are we going to vote? Well, there was a motion and a second. So, any discussion? I just wanted to make a point, a couple points. One is that. Um, <laughs> We, I think we have to understand we're under real time constraints here to get this information. No. I think it's essential that we do this tonight and move forward so that by Thursday we'll be in a position to sign a contract with Bruce because we've got our public forum and then within five weeks we have to make a decision. It's going to take two to three weeks to get that survey out there, get it back, get it collated and digested for us. So it's a very, very tight schedule. And again, we've worked very hard over the last eight months since the last survey, 
and um, we need to find out you know the fruits of our work and we need to learn if we have some things that we can improve upon but we have to get this data it's essential that we get uh, opinions on these three options and by the way a good pollster is going to have in there don't know you don't have to choose one exactly. any good pollster is going to have that option so that's really in my mind not going to be an issue there may be other questions that we can add that can maybe address some of the concerns that Caitlin and, and, and Cindy have expressed, and we'll have an opportunity to, to review that and work out the details with um, the actual questionnaire. In well, any how case- do, How do you vote, Larry? What's your I, vote? I, well, definitely vote yes. Let's proceed with Portland Okay, Harvard, perfect, Portland perfect. It, just any, a point of, point of order, Madam Chair. I had Tim with the motion and- I second by Penny. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I had my scorecard clean. So, thank, thanks for the moment. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Uh, right, so Patrick, you're six. six. Unanimous. Right. Uh, did he, did he say I, I feel though. I I voted for the survey, but I also feel like. Like there's there's room here that if we have a, a significant disagreement during the question, like I don't know, like like we voted to we voted we just voted to green light Bruce to start work on this, right? That's what we're voting on. Right. Exactly. All right, Bruce. Anybody did a great opposed? job last time. Just to be clear, there I'm, were disagreements. I'm, I'm not anti. -Bruce. There were there were. Anybody opposed? It's nothing major, but there were you know there was nuance to a lot of this, and I thought Bruce did an excellent job, and I'd look forward. I think we all should look forward to working with him next week on all this. So thank you, everyone, for supporting that. No, I, I, I mean, I'll just comment. I, w I wasn't a, uh, it's just really important, I think, that, that we're very collaborative in our approach with, with Bruce this time, and we're clear about our objectives in the survey, and maybe creative with, with how we capture the information. That's all. We move to public comment. We have finance up there. Hey, you can't, hey, you can't pack up yet. You're oh, no. Finance chair, we need to do a report. Money. Well, we talked a lot about the survey. <laughs> no. We actually talked a lot about uh, bringing Joe Katerra back in to help us as we, as we begin moving forward with some of our, uh, even with some of the revaluation data, uh, getting, he's back from vacation as I understand, so I think Matt's gonna contact him and, and, and work with some of that, but was there some others that I... That it's imperative that we get um, uh, data from Lisa in order to to do the net present value stuff. Yeah. 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 So, so Matt, more, the, Matt as, will be connecting with her. Yeah, and, and I think the CPI stuff is the, the uh, CIP uh, information, the more detail we can get on that with specifically as it, we're moving forward with renovations. Uh, so I, I think some of the slides that were up there, we didn't actually get in our packet. To, to the, yeah, you, the, they're, they're, they're coming too. So, uh, they're, they're currently but I, I, I think the, the point is to get Joe back involved with helping us so, and, and getting it out earlier, as early as we can for everybody. Yeah. Um, so they have more time to, to look at all the, op, all the options and all the, the uh, impacts from a tax standpoint, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the cookies, to, and is there any? I just wanted uh, to add one thing, Penny, oh, to God speaking again. comments regarding Finance Committee, and that is that I think what Joe Katerra is, has a PhD in economics, he's got a life experience in dealing with uh, looking into the future for cost, bonding, and, and he's a registered financial advisor, he has tremendous expertise, but what he's going to need is the Harriman's model that they have used and will use to calculate these long-term cost comparisons. Then he'll be able to offer his analysis and input to help us refine and develop, uh, you know, a discussion around the uh, assumptions that are made, plus the data points that are calculated in this long-term analysis. Anyway, so, so, so to Lisa, if you could help us with that, that'd be much appreciated, and we'll get that to Joe. We'll, we'll follow up. Yeah. We'll follow up. Yeah. We'll follow up. Yeah. We'll follow up. Yeah. Public comment. 
Hi, how are you? Thank you for sticking it out. How many cookies did you have? Uh, yeah, uh, Al Romano, four for Wood. Committee did a great job tonight. Feel good. Um, I had a few questions pop up during the Lisa's terrific presentation. The committee asked them. I have a couple more, but I'll send them in, the, in an email. Have a good night. Thanks, Al. You're going to create that Google Doc, correct? OK. Any other? We should submit by Wednesday or Tuesday questions. OK. I think as soon as possible. Yes, they do. OK. Monday? Yeah. By end of day Sunday? <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> time. That's my Sunday morning yeah, work online. now. Yes, Madam Chair, we have three, uh, three raised hands online. Uh, OK. Starting, starting with Chris Gorski. Well, Ahead. First one, go for it. Who, uh, are, yes. who are you and where do you live? <laughs> Chris Gorski, 28 Farm Hill Road. Um, yeah, I appreciate everyone's hard work tonight and another another exciting late night. Um, I, I think I had to echo some of the comments on on the survey, kind of the questions of what are we what are we getting out of it? What's the questions? I, I feel like um, from my communications around town with folks, the people who were, were still a no vote, they haven't, no information has been sent out except to those of us who are, are you know, obsessively following this alongside with you guys. Um, we know all the details because we read the emails and go to the website and see the stuff. And, and we saw the, the Google feedback said 78% of those people who sent in feedback, you know, give or take, you know, the duplicates um, wanted option G. So clearly the, the people who are engaged and sending feedback in, is that group who's aware of the needs. The people who are not engaged, who will hear, finally hear from in a survey, uh, haven't been told what the needs are. They aren't checking the, the one page of the website that has the needs on it. They didn't read the Harriman reports. They don't care. Um, they're not, th that engaged segment is not seeing information. And, and that's the thing that's real disappointing to me is if we're gonna set, if we send out another survey before any sort of communication goes out, um, you know, we, we saw people say, hey, we hate, I hate the location of it because it's right behind my house. Um, I, I, I can't support that. I mean, these options are all in flux. We're constantly refining things with Harriman, making adjustments, you know, trying to fine tune it. And then at the same time, we're going to ask people to pick one. Meanwhile, they're going to change, you know, in two weeks when Harriman makes an adjustment. Um, so I, I'm just really, I'm really concerned that that 38%, that 42%, I think, I forget the exact number in the last survey that said there's no problem. Um, the schools don't need don't need a big change. Um, that we haven't that nothing's been done to really reach out to those people and inform them of what the needs are. Um, I think there's just a lot of there's a lot of that segment that when we send a survey to ask them questions, they're going to be like, yeah, it still still doesn't need anything. School's been going on for the past two years. Nothing that seems fine to me because um, they're not engaged. Um, and so I think I think it's a real disservice to send out a survey. Um, without uh, first providing some sort of communication and some sort of information beyond beyond things that um, attract those of us who are engaged and are interested. Um, but yeah, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next. And we have uh, Mr. Volz will be next. And oh, John, we don't. John, talk you should, your microphone should now be live, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Um, I know this is not generally a two-way thing, but I just had a couple, two key questions for you as you're considering your process. You all voted to move ahead with the survey, but I was a little concerned that there was not any kind of agreement on what the purpose of the survey is. So my process question is, when is you as a committee going to agree what the purpose of the survey is? And then if you're not going to agree, how do you think that survey where you haven't agreed on the purpose is going to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, John. And just a moment. And next we have Agley's, uh, Agley's phone and your microphone should be live. Agley, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. There, Agley, your, your microphone should be on now. It's still showing that John's on. Let's try that again. Ah, okay. There we go, I got gotcha. you. Hello. 
Hi, Aglai Shaw, 8 Woodcrest Road. My apologies for not updating the name on my phone. Um, first of all, thank you all for all the work that you're doing um, here and just recognize it's really late and that you've put a lot into this. Um, you know, I, I joined a little late, but I was really struck as I was listening at how some um, some voices felt like they were bulldozing others when really great and important perspectives by people with a lot of experience were being brought up. It's clear that a survey is going to happen. Um, clearly, you all voted to move it forward, and um, it, it seems like no survey is not the option. Um, so going along with that and then seeing it as an opportunity, um, I, I agree with what has been said. I. When I talk to people and I ask them their opinion, you know, things come out like, I think rebuilding is irresponsible and only renovation should happen. But then when they learn a little bit more, you know, they might change their mind. And so I think just in asking these questions, sure, you're going to hear what people are interested in. But I think you also need to gauge um, what are some of their values around stuff like this? And a simple question like, do you think you have the information needed to make this decision? Um, how would you rate your, your understanding of the state of the schools? Um, and so given that the survey is gonna happen, given that um, you're set on this timeline, um, there is an opportunity to just better understand these responses when they come back. Uh, Cause I fear that you're not gonna get the cross section of data that you're really hoping for. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. That's it. Anybody else out there want to say anything? Uh, guess not. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you all. All those in favor? Drive, drive careful, Chuck. <laughs>